You're hot on that one? I'll make sure that you're good on this. Perfect. Let me do this real quick. Yeah, I do, dude. I got Instagram going hot, so these guys hopefully can hear us. Uh, if I, I wish I could put my, if I could put it somewhere where I can't though, where they could see everybody and still hear us all. Maybe that would be the cool part if I could do that. If I can put it, I wonder if I could put it right here like this. And still be able to hear us all talk. Think that'll work? You can't set that camera, that phone on the. That's cool. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. All right, guys, here's what's happening. You don't have to have me in there. <laughs> Could get a little tripod over there. Yeah. That'll work. I'm not gonna be able to see questions, but just tell you guys. I can set your phone over there too. I'll watch. Yeah, and that's the thing. I'd gladly take some questions. Yeah. Yeah, um, that, and they will too. And, and they'll ask you the questions that yeah. matter to them. I'll set you know? well, I'll set my phone right here if they throw something at us. Okay. If they want a secret, I'm not saying, so we'll just mm -hmm. keep it vague. <laughs> That's what another thing, I just had a guy on YouTube say some stuff about sounds and this and that, and I'm like, dude, it just sucks to say, but there's, it's just like you're calling spots to a certain extent. I don't like to mislead by any means, but there's just certain things that you've got to have to go figure out for yourself. Yeah. I'm not saying that I know anything more than anybody else, but there's certain, certain things, I mean... I, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe in our area there is. Uh, how, can you do a little test on there? Test, test. How's it sound? It sounds good. Good. If, you, the, if you're about that distance, that'll be good. Don't okay. be afraid to get, I've got a limiter on here so we can get as, as, you can get as close as you want without popping anything. And then I got that. Got everything. I just wish I could see the dang questions here. Thing is, is they won't. They'll be. Is is yours joined on? Is that? Yeah, it'll it'll pull up every question right there on the bottom. The same as what mine are. Yeah. How many people you got on? Twenty-five, right. maybe is on. I think the last time we had live, the last time we did it, we had a like sixty or seventy, which is usually. I mean, on Instagram at the same time, that's pretty good for us, but. Uh, and this time of day, it's tough. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, the day. they're working. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Oh, I got you. Okay, here we go. All right, guys, we have, just so that can, if they can hear us, all right, we'll, hopefully they can hear the questions pretty decent. Well, what I could do is just set this closer then, if I'm reading the questions on yours. That way, they'll, that'll be a center, yep. essential deal here. Go like this. Get you, get you guys on there. You can just set that up, Keith. Help. Set that however it's good. <laughs> if that works, that'll cool. work. Just so guys can kind of hear it, hear, hear us talk better. They should be able to. Okay, that's hot. That's hot. I'm going to do a little bit of an intro, and then we'll just kind of start talking. Yeah, we got it. jacking me up pretty good. My first one lit me up. Yeah. So I'm shaking. <laughs> All right, I'll do my little intro here and we'll be rolling.
What's up, guys? I'm James O'Neill. You're here with O'Neill Ops, and this is the Predator Hunter Podcast. This is the place where we break it down. We go into detail with the equipment that we use and how we use that equipment application specific. Today, this is going to be a fun one. We haven't done it like this yet before, but we have Les Johnson in-house. We have, we're going Instagram Live, so you guys are going to be some of the first to, to hopefully you can hear it and see what's going on pretty good. But we'll make sure and have this up on, on, uh, on YouTube this week. Should have it up on the Anchor platform this week as well, so you guys can listen on Spotify and uh, iTunes. And then maybe we'll see what, what uh, Les can do on his end. He gets a lot of followers, a lot of guys, a lot of views on Facebook Live. So hopefully we can get something figured out from that that aspect as well. So without further uh, intro, let's just have less talk about kind of, I, I would like to go into it first and just go into some detail, kind of who you are. I would say most of the guys, all of the guys that listen to us already know who you are. Might not be so much the other way around, but I'm always interested in guys' mindsets that are successful uh, for your success. I would, I would assume I'd probably be safe to assume you've had goals throughout your life in order to uh, obtain the accomplishments that you have. I'd like to have some of our viewers hear you s- explain what your goal, what some of your goals are and how they've got you to where you are today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Keith. You guys, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess When so many people tell me, they meet me, they say, Les, it must be rough getting to do what you get to do. And, you know, I am honored. And anytime that you put yourself out there and going after goals in life, and especially when you're going after your dream from a childhood standpoint and you become successful – people will envy you. And with that envy is jealousy and all the other factors. But as a person, it can either deter you or it can make you stronger. And I can tell you from my standpoint, it only gave me fuel. Um, I'm one of those guys that uh, whenever I set out to do something, I usually get it done. And one of the things from the time I was a kid, I was thoroughly intrigued by coyotes. And it was only because my grandfather, I I asked him one time, I said, Grandpa, what's the smartest animal you trap? And he said, hands down, it's a coyote. So from that point in time in my life, that was the one animal I wanted to figure out. And I wanted to basically impress my grandfather. My grandfather ended up dying whenever I was 16 years old. So the regret I have is that he didn't get to see where I am today because I'm sure he would be happy. But he taught me so much in such a little amount of time about coyotes. And from that, it gave me the goal. I wanted to learn how to call coyotes. And in my part of Nebraska, where I'm from, South Central Nebraska, we just don't quite have the calling atmosphere. We're more of a trapping setup because we have fence lines, we've got creeks, and tons of farm fields. So calling was a little bit tougher. And for me to set out to call was just a whole different mindset. And whenever I started calling with my brother, it was me and him, Jeff. Then we got into the point where we started to see a few competitions show up. So then we started entering competitions. And once we entered competitions, the way I look at a competition was when I was younger is I'm competing against guys that are on my level, guys above my level, below my level. I want to see how I compare with other competition callers in the same conditions. So started entering competitions. And then one of my goals, like you said, James, I I've been very goal oriented my whole life. And my goal was, I want to be one of the best coyote callers on the planet. Now 
that can be argued, you know, what's the best? Well, who knows what the best is? I, I'm always going to give it my all. I'm going to do whatever I can. But like I said, with that said, you're going to have guys jump on the bandwagon to try to tear you down. And I've had that happen before because I posted that on my website as one of my my testimonial of how I got to where I am today. I, I quoted that I wanted to be one of the best coyote callers. And it's written about in forums. Les Johnson thinks he's the best. No, I don't think I'm the best. I want to be one of the best. So what I want to say to anybody listening is the fact that you can anybody out there can be like me and and I'm not saying I'm the best. I don't even say that I'm one of the best. Anybody can put their mind in their heart and give it their all. You you've got to first conquer that fear of thinking you cannot do it. So you've got to put yourself out there to go after it. So that's kind of where it all went and entering in all the competitions. Um, I hit that stage in my life where I wanted to compete, 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 compete. And then I got to a point where I was burnt out. I, I did everything. How long would you say, like from the time you started competing to when you kind of got burned out, honestly, I would say I started competing in 1989 and got burnt out pretty much about 2006, but I still competed clear up to about 2012 with only a couple competitions because it's very, it's very stressful and it's very, very labor intensive to scout for a competition. You know, it'll take you a week to go try to find coyotes, try to get on the right properties, and then try to learn the lay of the land. So it's, it takes a lot mentally. And I've told people, so many people want me to keep competing and I'd love to compete just to see the people, but I don't really care about winning. I don't have it in my heart no more. And I've told people that I'm not in the right mindset. In order to be that kind of a killer, I've got to be in a whole different mindset um, because I'm in a zone. When when I'm in that zone, I'm not missing a coyote. Um, As an example, one time when my brother and I won the national, and this was probably in 99 or something like that, we killed 15 coyotes in a day and a half, I killed 13 of them. He killed two with shotgun. He always carried the 10 gauge. He killed two. I killed 13, but I never missed a single coyote. And there were several I'd call in doubles. I'd kill the first one, kill the second one. They're both open. Just boom, get on Mm -hmm. the other one, boom. Um, I was in a zone, and I'd make shots at coyotes leaving or wind us at 300, 350 yards and just smoke them on the roll I or on the run. I just – you have to be – it's – probably comparable to being a sniper you know yep. you've, yeah. you've got to be in and even when we'd go to competitions me and my brother he's the boisterous one likes to have a Budweiser do the thing you know and I do too but I would never drink at competitions I was in a whole different mind frame and I went to bed early you know Tori and Todd Hyde, love them guys to death from North Dakota. They'd stay up till one, two in the morning drinking, and I can't do that. You know, I've, yep. it's a whole different mind frame. For it's me. a it's a profession. Yeah, it's it's that's what a professional yep. athlete exactly how they look at it. Yeah, and so anybody can do what I've done. Anybody, it it, it just it, it's too easy in today's day and age to get distracted. I don't even care for Facebook. I don't. If it wasn't for my fans, I wouldn't have Facebook. I wouldn't have Instagram. I'm I'm terrible about posting because I'm not good at bragging about myself or posting my stuff. I, I mean, people love to see my my yep. pictures, but yep. I I think to myself, I don't want to do a selfie. I don't want to do. I I don't like that. You know, that's just the way I am. You know, and um, but I love to, as I've gotten older, I love to pass on the knowledge of how to be better without thinking you can never be that good. You know, I want everybody listening right now to know you don't have to be like me. You don't have to say, I'm not good as less. I'm not this. 
everybody can be, but they've got to get out of that mindset thinking, well, I bet they're doing better. I bet they're doing better. And you can't say that, you know. That's awesome. That's a that's a, a really good way to put it for guys that I you know in a similar way I'm kind of I'm kind of close to I don't like doing selfie stuff, but the people that follow you, they want to see it. Yeah. They want to they want to see more and of it. Feel it. You know, feel the, you know, what it took to do it. You exactly. Know? I want to see that. And I'll, I'll tell you what I was I I actually planned on and and mentioning this in the intro. I've had a lot of guys ask us about, you know, I don't, we don't, I don't, we don't stroke anybody off. I mean, we're, we're our own thing. Yeah. We do our own thing. We're not competition. We, we are, are, it's a lifestyle similar to how it is a lifestyle for you because you're a professional at it. But I explain to guys regarding television personally, this is my personal opinion. I, I like watching, I like watching Shockey. I like watching Miranda and, I would classify you as in in the same realm regarding you know predators. If I'm going to watch somebody on TV hunt coyotes, it was you know we we watched a lot of your stuff because you were killing coyotes. I don't want to see guys stacking up pigs. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see guys shooting alligators or shooting red fox on the East Coast. I want to see some guy that can kill the shit out of coyotes in the Midwest just freaking stack them up. And who else does it? There, it's it's just that's where I think probably a lot of guys really like watching you and do what you do. There's not a lot of guys that even do that anymore. Yeah, you know, I don't think there's any. Yeah, you don't you you watch yeah. TV and there's just, it's just yeah yeah. So well, one I, week one week they might be killing coyotes and the next week they're in a tree stand after a whitetail or something. You know, and it's it's a predator show. Is that hard for you to not incorporate some kind of big game like ah let's do it let's do a deer hunt on here. Well, I've always said my name Predator Quest was just after Predators. Now, I've filmed some hog stuff, but only because I was down there killing, pit, you know, yeah, coyotes yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I've had people even on forums, and, and, and this is the bad thing, you know. People say, if they say one bad thing about you, it can deter other people that want to learn. It can divert them, you know, because they think they might be saying the truth. But I've had people, and this is funny, you know, I laugh about it, but... It, you know, somebody will say, well, if you see one of Les Johnson's shows, you've seen them all. It's the same thing over yeah. and over. If, and I laugh and I say, well, that's because I'm killing shit. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a real coyote hunter, you're not seeing the same thing over and over. Right. I mean, you might be seeing a guy pull a trigger and kill coyote, but you, if, you, if you're a real coyote hunter, you're not watching yeah. the same thing over and over. I've exactly. had guys say the same thing. You got to break up the monotony. You can't kill the same coyotes <laughs> in the same place and do the same thing you I beg to differ yeah I mean I would say you'd probably proved it too well it's just like you know I sent you about two weeks ago you know my brother and I've been hunting together our whole life he's 53 I'm 51 and we it's crazy we went to this spot house on the hill old abandoned house and we're on the backside. the winds in our face and we're driving up there putting on the four-wheeler we get off and I we started walking towards it and it was just run down everything there. You know, there's old vehicles, there's uh, rolls of wire, there's everything there. Little outhouse building, everything's dilapidated, f falling in. And I didn't even care what was on the other side because I knew I was going to call a coyote. I knew it. And I, I stopped and Jeff come walking up to me and I said, start filming right now. And I told him, I, I, I gave the lay of the land what was in front. And I told him, I said, we're going to call a coyote right here. Why? Because coyotes are going to be around all this because they're hunting bunny rabbits or, you know, and the hawks stay here. If they grab something, something's going to be screaming and hollering right here. We went up there, set up. He filmed everything. And I started calling, and it took – I had a cow out in front of me, a lone cow, and she was up on a fence line about a half mile away. And I kept watching that cow because, A, she would let me know if there was a coyote coming, or, B – if she snapped her head, I knew she heard the call and because I didn't want to blow it out there. It was just a little CRP field that led into all the hills. And you would say she was probably how far out there? She was about a half mile away. Okay. She yep. was a ways out yep. there. Yep, she was. And she never looked. She never looked. I played two series. She never looked. So then the, the third series, I cranked up the volume, and she brought her head up and looked. And then I left it up there a little bit, and I brought it back down. And I happened to turn and look out in the field and here come a coyote running over the hill. 
and then another one. And I turned and told Jeff, and he started filming. I turned back, and there was another one. And they were just running as hard as they could. And they come in, and I let them run right up to the call, right in front of me. They come loping right in front of me, and two of them got together. And I shot the front one, and I actually hit the back one, the one right behind it, drilled it, too, with one shot. And then I finished it, and then I got the, the third one running away. But – the point to all this is, as people say, you see less kill one coyote you've seen or seen one episode, you've seen them all. I'm 51 years old. That's the first time I've ever done that with my brother filming. First time ever uh, where we killed a triple with shotgun and they all came together. I shot them in three shots. So as old as I am and as many coyotes as I've killed, it still doesn't get old for me. You know, I see one coyote coming in, and I'm just excited as the first coyote I've seen come in. You know, and and I think if you ever lose that, yeah, you're done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. yep. But for all the people that are listening right now, I, I want you to know that, yeah, you're going to have a lot of bad days and tough days, but it gets better because every time you go out, you're learning, you're learning, you're learning. And that, even with me showing on TV, I, I'm plain and simple. But see, so many people think I'm not. They think I'm doing something secretive. I'm not. I tell everybody what sound I'm using, everything. I mean, I'm just like, man, I shouldn't probably be giving all this stuff away. Yeah. But, but you know, I'm if, if somebody finds my spot or where I go, I'll go to another one. I'll find another honey hole, yeah. you know. Yep. You showed me that. Are you, are you going to be airing that? Yeah. Did you, you didn't, did you? Post it somewhere? On no, I've never put it on because I didn't want to. You know what I mean? That's just because <laughs> it's it's kind of sacred to me. But I sent my card to my editor down in Florida, and he texted me this morning on my way up here. I told him he, he's already got all my rough cunt, uh, hunts rough cut, yep. and then I go through and watch them on Vimeo and do all that. But he uh, he texted me. He said, by the way, dude, that triple, shotgun triple was badass. Yeah, that, was know, like, that was nasty. With my was with it. my editor saying that, that tells me, you know, I, I struck something with him because, you know, they're all the same with him, you know. If but, if you don't appreciate that kill yeah, shot, yeah. you don't, you don't, you don't really care. That was, yeah. that was, I, you, that was legit. That was cool as hell. That was a zip, zip, zip. <laughs> yeah. Done. Boom, boom, boom. Done. It's hard to get on them that fast. I, you know what? Boom, boom, boom. So, Going into that, you were kind of talking, you know, when you get into your, your mindset, what do you see when you get into that? When you get in that and in, in, in you're freaking going to pull the trigger. I mean, what I would, I would say that a lot of the stuff you do may be more high speed than what we do because a lot of, to be honest, how we do it is you're going to kill them. No matter they're running in, they're running out, they're more than likely going to die. We have a lot of guys kind of, you know, oh, you guys got these $7,000 rifles and you're not even, you got coyotes running in front of you, you're not doing running shots and shit. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm filming it and I'm doing it a little bit different. We're kind of working them into a kill lane. And then yeah. if we can get them to stop and we'll get a good, maybe a headshot yeah. or something and, you know, work it from there. What kind of mindset are you in when you're going in and you're, for guys that might not understand, from the, the competition perspective? For me, whenever I walk in and set up, and I've said this on my TV show, when I walk over a hill, I'm thinking about my, my brother first, cameraman. He's got to have the spot that I would normally sit at if I was calling a coyote. He gets the best spot. Yep. yep. So I'm yeah, always absolutely. down lower, and I can't see as good yep. where I'm at, but I've got to be where I can make some shots. So I rely on him to tell me if there's some coming that if I'm setting too low, but even in that scenario, if it's not right, we'll walk another 400 yards to get yep. to the right yep. spot. And it's because I'm obviously thinking about my viewers too. I want the best, but yep. sometimes it just don't work that way. But yeah, that's, um, I still mess up. So I did have one come in this year, and this first one, he come in, I shotgunned, missed, and I rifled, I missed, and that thing was Mach 4 in and out. And my brother's like, geez, what happened, Les? I said, don't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're pretty similar as far as, I mean, the camera guy is for sure that. Yeah. For yeah. sure that. 
and then we sit real close though. Like he'll set up the camera guy will set up whoever's filming James or I or whoever, and then the the gunners will will get close, you know, yeah. close to that camera, uh, just for for you know Communic- let, communication, letting letting you know yeah. when when to pull the trigger. But definitely. I mean, sometimes I'm in I'm in kill mode, and James like, no, just wait, just wait. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, come on, man. You know, but, I'm uh, I'm all about milk in the yeah yeah you know, yeah footage yeah, yeah. footage is, is the and, is the and number good one. Stuff. Come yeah. in and stop. Yeah. Come in and stop. Yeah, you never know what that coyote's gonna do. He might stand there for three or four minutes and get you some cool dumb shit. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. That's 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 interesting. It's it's real it's real similar. But I mean, I can see how. From from a competition perspective, you know, getting into it, getting that trigger hot, you're just, it, it's it's a different, it's it's like Cal Cal t- when we went out and hunted with Cal, oh. he he was he he's a straight, per- he's a he didn't give killer man he didn't give two shits if you if you if it ain't on the camera he don't, he don't care, care it's gonna yeah. die yeah, yeah. he was there to strictly yeah. kill that coyote yeah and if he didn't come in he was gonna go get that coyote yeah. and kill him yeah me and James right he just threw me this the the remote one time and. And he said, here, play whatever you want. I'm going to go kill that coyote. And he was out there a 1,000 yards. Yeah, walking. And, and Cal's like, I'm going to go get him. And I looked at James like, holy shit, this guy's serious. Well, it, <laughs> And we were too, but it's like, you know, we've never hunted with anybody like that before. And and it was a good experience. Oh, yeah. that's uh, it, it, Those guys are a whole different mindset. You yep. know, they, they're they about protecting the wildlife and, yep, and yep. the calves and the sheep. And they cannot have one get away. No. They and I can't. think one did, we, you know, didn't kill him or whatever. And he said he went out with a helicopter the next day and got him. It's like, yeah, yeah, he, that's, that's pretty cool. It's, but it's, if we weren't filming, you know, we would stack no, I, and I'm sure you'd be the same way. Yeah. It'd be, you'd stack some numbers, but it's all about that footage. But the one thing is that I can say, you know, I competed against a lot of trappers in competition. A lot of them, their one hang up is they hear coyotes howl, so they go after them. Sure. And then they don't get them, and they keep going after that same group of coyotes. Yeah. Me, if I make three stands in a competition and don't call anything, I'm moving 10 miles, 20 miles. I'm going to try to call something whole different, whole different terrain. I'm going to try to find where there's coyotes. And uh, that's actually very detrimental to uh, in a competition. I, I've seen it happen so many times to – to guys that their livelihood is killing coyotes. They want to kill that coyote get so hung up bad. On a certain, yep, yep. They okay. get an old male that's howling at them, challenging them. They they spend yep. three hours, but yep. they kill that coyote. But in a competition, you got to sure. move on. You got to yep. cut the cord and go. When you were doing your competitions and, and big into it, how how many days a week were you hunting? Well, Maybe not even hunting, but just like you said, scouting and all that. How, what, how much time was involved in 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 your competition in a competition you know typically you need about three four days at least to drive and scout like for me i just drive through the country and if my eyes see what i like and i can i, I tell everybody it's like a, a giant computer up here when i drive through the country i see the land i like then i drive over there and i start driving through it and if i see scat and I see a lot of scat, I don't even need to see tracks. If I see scat that's not that old, I'm there. That's mm-hmm. where I'm going to hunt. And I'll never pre-call. I never do that. I don't how uh, so many guys in the whole industry, they'd go out at, you know, the morning of the hunt, they'd go out at 2 in the morning and start howling. Yeah. And I want to use this example because I've said it before, but so many people need to hear this. I've never... I've never howled for coyotes going out and locating. I've never done I don't need to. Um, and and the reason I say that is because you've got to hunt like they're there. Now, when you howl and if you don't know what you're doing, if if you're doing stuff you shouldn't do, that coyote knows if that don't sound right over there. It's just like if you were on this place and you heard a a voice saying something, you say, I've never heard, who the heck's that? Yep. Coyotes tend to know that stuff. So a buddy of mine was in a competition he had a ranch that was 50,000 acres, never got hunted, never got hunted for coyotes. And he goes out, and the morning of the hunt, he goes out, and he's on this big, wide-open flat, and he parks, and it's pitch black to him. He gets out, and he plays uh, Sunrise Serenade, and he proceeds to go to the b- back of the vehicle, and he's taking a leak, and it's doing its thing. And it's still barking and howling, the e-call, on his vehicle, 
and he has a coyote 200 yards from him challenging him out in the wide open flat. He said that thing was close to me. So I go up front and I shut it off, and then the whole country just lights up everywhere. He said, Les, I'll kid you not, there was 30 to 50 coyotes howling. As far as I could hear, I could hear coyotes. I, they were a mile away. They're a half mile away, every direction. He starts that hunt that day. They never killed a coyote that whole day. That whole day. He said, why didn't we? We, we should be able to win the hunt on that. I said, dude, you let every coyote in the country know you were there. Every coyote knew you were danger. So they went on high alert. And then you went through the country calling, calling, and they were like, eh, something's not yep. right here. Yep. And they didn't come in. And that is one of the big things for me. I don't like to even let them know I'm there. I just like to slip in. And especially, and I shouldn't even give this trick or secret. <laughs> God. Here, let us shut the record <laughs> off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> if I walk in and set up on a stand, I walk in, I set up, I'm just getting situated. And before I start calling, I have two coyotes over here howling. Then I have another one over here howling. And the wind's right here in my face. I don't call right there. I just get up, get out, go right over to them two, kill them, come back, go right over to that one. Reason being, see, this is where it's at all psychological with coyotes. Everything's psychological when you start playing on their level. They howled. And they heard that one how. So you go over there and you start using just rabbit distress. You don't need to howl. You don't need to do nothing. You play rabbit distress. They instantly think, well, that cocksucker come over here and yep. he caught a rabbit right by us. Let's go kick his butt. And they just come in 90 mile an hour and you can probably shotgun both of them. And then you can slip over and do the same to that one. Now he might come in slower because he's a single and just be cautious, but he's going to come check it out. Yep. I do that all the time, and so many people will sit right there and howl or whatever and try to – and then they got them all coming. You know what I mean? So, But that's, that's psychological stuff for competition too because I want all of them dead, not just one of them that comes in, you know? Yeah. And from that perspective, how many times would you say does that happen to you? A lot. Really? A lot. Um it happened uh, the last year that I won the national. We walked in to set up, and I only made one really soft call. And I've said this in my Facebook Lives, um, me and Robert and Blake, and I sent him downwind about 150 yards. It was pitch black, and we snuck in there. And uh, there was a big sand dune right in front of me, and it started getting light enough. I could see the whole sand dune, and I was holding shotgun. He was just had a rifle. And I had my rifle, so I just, and I, I played real soft with my hand call, and just, I was short and quick. And right when I got done, it, it was probably 30 seconds after I got done, right on the other side of that sand dune. That sand dune's 250 yards, right on the back side of it. Ooh, ooh, whoop, and he barked at the end. I knew exactly what he was doing. He was calling his bitch. But that bark was a warning. A lot of people won't catch that. And he barked at the end just because he was like, everybody out there, listen up. I'm telling you, there's bad stuff going on. Just watch your nine. And he barked. And then I just sat there and I just watched. And he never come up over the he never come up over the sand dune. He stayed on the back side. Cause I could shot him right there, like right there. About Three minutes later, he howls, and then his bitch is with him. She howled right there with him, and they just did their serenade, and then they shut up, and I go, now it's going to get good. And I just sat there and sat there, and probably took five minutes. Two miles to my right, east, a, l a lone little female pup out there howled. And then they just start, okay, there's one over here about a mile. There's two more about back there about a mile and a half. There's some there, there. And I, I said, well, behind me there's one. And then behind that one there's two more. So I get up. After all the howling's done, I probably heard 20 coyotes howl. I get up, and I sneak down to Robin, my partner. And when I got down there, you know, he didn't know I'd quit, and he heard me hit a sagebrush, and he just jumped. You know, he thought <laughs> I had a coyote right there. I said, let's go. And he goes, what? 
what are you doing? Let's go kill those. And I said, no, let's go back to the pickup. I'll tell you what's going on when we get back there. We went back there, got my pickup. I'm doing 80 mile an hour down the road. I looked at my odometer right when we hit the main road, and I went a uh, mile and three quarter, pulled over. I told him on the way down, I said, had we called, we would have screwed up this whole country. First stand, she run us over. I shotgunned her, and, and we killed nine that day. With The wind came up to about 40 mile an hour. We actually came right back to that stand where we were setting, and I called in that other male that was out there in front of us howling. We went in a little bit farther. We walked in, big old white male, and he come up running in and shotgunned him. And then the next day of the contest, the short day, we killed 11 more. Now, we killed 20 in a day and a half. We wouldn't have killed four coyotes in there had we went in and just yep. done our thing, yep. you know. Yep. But how do you learn that, yeah. right? Yeah. How do you learn that? Yep. you you got to be out there a long time to learn and understand. It's easy to say, ah, screw it. Let's just try it. No. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's cool. That's interesting. So what have – what are what did you do to win that year that you were most successful? What were your uh, the the competitions? What were they? Shotgun, um, never giving up on a shotgun. It, it, the number one thing is. So you were taking your long gun and your shotgun with on every set. Virtually every time I did, there was some sets I wouldn't. When my brother was doing the shotgun, and that's all he carried, but he yep. also carried a two two three. He got to a point because sometimes we'd be calling, and I'd have a coyote just keyed on me at two hundred yards, and I'm laying clear down in the sagebrush, and I couldn't move. That way, he could just if I would lip squeak or something, he would know. Okay, it's time for me to kill him, and then he would smoke him. But um, the, the the thing about a shotgun is it teaches you patience. It teaches you so many things about the animal that the average person never figures out because they're shooting them out there at 150, 200. Now, I'm going to I'm going to do the back side of that now. At one of the at one of the pre meetings, there was a, a team from South Dakota, and I can't remember their names. Uh, hopefully, one of them's watching. But they had huge beards before before all these guys had their beards. These guys were coyote killing fools from South Dakota brothers, and that's what I loved about a lot of the competitions. We met brothers or really tight friends that had done it a lot of years. They come to the pre-meeting the one night and I I'd always ask him, you got a good spot or you've been seeing coyotes. Oh yeah. We scout a spot. Oh my gosh. We got Kyle. We're on top of Kyle. We're going to win this hunt. That's usually what they'd say. And I'd say, nah, I won't say that I'd be careful. And, and he goes, Oh, I'm and we'd start talking about rifles and he, Oh, I'm on my game, man. They stop at two, two fifty. I just smoke them right where they stay. They stand. And I said, why don't you let them come closer? Well, why? And I said, well, if a coyote comes into 50 yards and you miss him there, you usually got several other opportunities to get him on the way out. You shoot at 250, he bolts right over the hill, he's gone. Ah, I'm just that good. That's the way he was. Second day of the hunt, here they come to check in. And, I mean, he's just looking down, kicking rocks the whole time. The whole time. I said, where's all these coyotes? He said, man, I messed up. I said, what would you do? I missed five in this hunt. I never missed less. I don't know what happened. I said, that's the reason. You, number one, you never say that. Number two, <laughs> you, you, the goal is to bring them closer. And it, it, there's so much more to outsmarting them then, and you can start playing on a whole different level, you know. I think that uh, even by doing that, I would say maybe in the beginning phases of, of newer callers, like you said, you can learn so much more. Yeah. You can see them, you can study them, you know what they're going to do. And I don't want to say you can apply that that principle to every coyote, but you can apply it to a broad range of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's that's real interesting too. From your early days of calling, what have you seen as far as the call itself change-wise um and what do you think the e-call's done to the to the coyote calling? Well, um, as far as calling goes, I sound the same. I do the same. I tune the reeds. I, I, I do everything the same from a hand call perspective. Well, there's your secret, though. You're tuning the damn reed. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> so, don't keep, keep. no, 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 that it, there is a lot to that, but what makes my ear know that it's the right way it's supposed to sound? You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know, but I can I can snip a little bit off the reed. I like a square end. I don't like a round end. So if I square it and I can just go, wah, wah, and I know instantly if that's the right sound that it needs to make. Um, so the hand calling... I love because it taught me patience. It taught me to work a coyote. I've worked coyotes for 20, 30 minutes just to shotgun them. Whereas so many people, you know, and now. And we he, grew up with the, with a hand call. That's, yeah. a, that's how we learned. And, and he's out there at 600 sitting on the side of a hill. Yeah, what do you do now? Well, screw up eight clicks and put it on him and pull the trigger. I don't do that. See, I'm, I, I, I and no disrespect to anybody that shoots long distance. That's not me. And the only reason that's not me is because I'm kind of like that government trapper. I don't want to let that coyote get the best of me. So I work him, work him, work him. And if he turns and leaves and go over the hill, then I'll go over there and try to call him. But I like to see what triggers him. And a lot of times, just a lip squeak will get him to come in. I've had him come from a long way. They've sat there, sat there, sat there. I let him sit there, and then I'll do the lip squeak. Now, go into the, the e-call. The e-call has so many pluses to it that I can't do. Like playing continuous, if the wind's 15 to 20 mile an hour, and you can, you can call a crosswind, and you can just let it play at full full volume and you can let it play for five minutes where my lungs wear out. I can, I got to wait for the wind to come down and then give it all I got. Um, the e-call can take the focal point away from you. Um, that coyote's looking for that e-call, which makes it really good. In Especially a lot for of, filming. Oh, yeah. filming. Yeah. And then you got another hunter that's maybe moving a lot. He's not used to it or whatever, you know, there, there, and the other thing, obviously with e-calls, you're playing sounds that you can't make with a hand call, yep. you know? Yep. I mean, pup distress, you've got fighting sounds, you've got all kinds of stuff, you know? It's um, it's it, it's changed the game, I'm going to say, but with that change, it's made a lot of callers actually probably worse because they expect more because they're buying – a $600 call, and they think if they push the button, they should have a coyote run in like O'Neill Ops does, and I, we should be able to kill it, you know. But it don't happen that way. There's more yeah, to yeah. the calling, volume, the yep. sequence of the sound, everything in the setup, you know. Yep. And like James has said before with that e-caller, you'll get them guys that, that go out and make their sets and call and call and then get discouraged because they don't get anything in, and then they're done. Yeah. And they're, 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 you know, don't do it anymore. And I think it goes back to kind of what you said. The shotgun and the hand call is a, a similar situation. You're 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 letting them come in. You're learning from that animal. That's stuff that if if you don't do it, what I'm seeing a lot online is there's all these forums. Everybody wants to know the the trick. They yeah. want to know how to do it without putting in the thousands yeah. of miles on foot that you have. Yeah, you know, and it's so easy to just. I mean, not easy, but it's it, it's not a deterrent to tell them it, it's it's not that hard to call in a coyote. It's really it, it's it's not, but you gotta you gotta learn how to do it. Yeah. And by like you said, you you do a shotgun. You start with a hand call. You learn what they do. You watch them come in. All the little details that you mentioned, just like you said, with a long gun, shooting them out there at two hundred and fifty yards. If you miss, he's probably. You, unless you make a hell of a run and shot at three or 400 yeah. yards, he's probably gone. Yeah. If you can work them, get them in closer, you have more opportunities to take that animal. And there's so many little aspects that guys just, it, it doesn't even trigger in their brain to think yeah. about little things like that. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, an example, I, uh, and this was clear back probably, I'm going to say in the late eighties, we were custom harvesters, so we'd go south to Oklahoma, start, end up clear up Montana, North Dakota. So when we got back from fall uh, from summer harvest, we started fall harvest. And typically, um, when the crops weren't ready, we were doing all the machinery work, and then right about sundown, um, 
we didn't have nothing going for the next morning real early. So me and my brother, we, the wind had died down. Let's go make a stand. So we drove about 15 miles from the house, me and him. We had time for one stand. And we get almost to where I want to go. I'd never called this spot. It was close to a river. I'd always eyeballed it from the road. And uh, is one of them look both ways and run out there. And no. <laughs> no, it was a nice spot. It was just a nice pasture that led right to a river. And um, we get down there, and I forgot my hand call. And he didn't have one. So I'm like, son of a gun. But I'd always wanted to call with my hand, always. So I said, Jeff, I don't know if I'll be loud enough, but let's just go out there. It was dead calm. So we go out there. And I send him up above me about 150 yards, and he had a shotgun and a rifle. And all it was was just a wide open pasture, but there was plum thickets about a half mile away. And I just, and I tried to get as loud as I could, and I turned my head, and I wanted the sound to go towards them plum thickets. And our thing was, like, when we couldn't talk, one thing we did was we got on the gun. Then I knew he saw one. And out of the corner of my eye, I'd only called like once or twice with my hand. I saw my brother raise his gun. I go, holy crap. And I started looking. I seen this big old red coyote just loping in. And he come to about, you know, 200 and Jeff shot him. But the moral of the story was that so many times I'd go call. And I always think, it don't sound good enough. It ain't loud enough. I, I can't call one in with my hand. There's no way one would want to come to that sound. But I did it, and that's all it took. So then, after that, I, I've called in a ton of bobcat with that sound. Um, and it's just, I don't use it that much, but if I'm in really, really tight cover, like cedar trees and rock canyons and stuff, I'm telling you, a coyote will come in to 10 feet, just boom, be right there, you know? And it's, I just want to give guys the peace of mind to know that you don't have to have the right hand call. You don't have to have the right e-call. It, it's all about doing it and taking control and just being a leader and doing it. You know, that's the toughest part of all of this. Yeah. You know, exactly. what sound, how do we do it? You know, that's, that's exactly, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things where that you, you can, you can, it can be a double bladed sword. You can overthink it yeah, and you can break it down. You can learn everything that you have in the very beginning. And then you can also, you know, you can, you can scare a lot of guys, yeah. a lot of guys, like you're saying, you can overthink it. Yeah. You really can. And I think where we are with kind of what we're doing here, I mean, what's your thoughts on, on, uh, I mean, if you, if you're, you're, doing the TV thing uh, your, from your competition, high-pressure areas. Do you just go right on past? Well, it, it, it all depends. If, I'm, if I feel like I'm in a high-pressured area, I'm going to howl a little bit more. But I'm going to be a very submissive howl, and I've said this. I, I have a sequence I use, and I just howl three times, and I, I try to sound like more of a uh, – a small female, and I sa I, I, I want to sound very, very submissive. Hey, I'm over here. Um, is there anybody else out there? I'm just lonely. And if I think I'm in a pressured area, I'll do that series. Then I'll do about five minutes later, I'll do the same three howl series. And then I may go into rabbit distress. But that's how I'm going to try to loosen them up just to let them know that I'm an actual coyote and I'm not something else. And I'll use just hand call, you know? So from going right into that, how often do you personally from personally, when we go out, I almost, it's easy to think, all right, I did this and this and this. So I'm just going to keep on using the same exact thing. Yeah. But a lot of times when I go in there, I'm like, I'm doing it different yeah. and it works yeah. for guys that want to know like a sequence. How often do you keep the exact same sequence at each set that you make? Well, if it's calmer and I know other coyotes are hearing, I don't want to use the same sound all the time. So I switch it up between several different cottontail sounds um, just because I know, and I try to remind myself not to play very loud 
because I don't want the whole countryside hearing that sound and then, you know, seeing us walking around or hear a thump or something. So I'm pretty anal about that, obviously. Real anal, actually. Is there such thing as a call shy coyote to you? Somewhat. We had one come in downwind or circle around us this year. That's the first one I had all year. I had yeah. one. One. He started out in front and he went right to my downwind, but that's the only one I had out of. Yeah. And I, it, he could have seen us shine. And I told my brother, I said, I can't believe there'd be a call shy coyote like that. But I'm. Yes, there is call shy coyote. I know that. But uh, and some areas are worse. I know. Yeah. And I I hear about it a lot. But the way I battle it is I try to get closer to where they're sleeping. So instead of calling from this road, I'm yeah. hiking in there. I try yep. to be quiet. Yep. I try not to make no noise. I don't want a, a pickup bouncing through the hills per se. Um, that's when, just like we were talking earlier, you know, last year, Jeff and I, I logged the miles. Um, I think we walked 15.3 or 4 miles at my best guess. That's in and out, and we killed four coyotes that day, and I think I made 18 stands. I had everything marked down, but it was just I wanted people to know that it, it's not easy for us either. We're putting the work in, and, and by doing that, you always learn something. You know, you're learning as you go, and that's what you got to do. Sometimes that's, that's the way you get that double. You know, you got to yeah, walk yeah. Her back in there with them. Yep. Yeah, we're definitely not afraid to walk. We do the same yep. same thing. I mean, it's it's work. Yeah. But it, that's that's exactly the way to look at it. Um on the the year that you were like I said earlier more like one of your your from your calling from your competition standpoint what were the competitions that you won? Triple Crown? Yeah. So it, explain to guys what that is. And what go go into detail on each one of those if you would, and kind of the what what your what you did going into it, how you were successful at it if you can break those down. Yep. So so there back in the day, um, and this was in 1999. This happened. There was three bigger Western competitions, and it was the national, which was always out of Rollins, Wyoming. The worlds, which was a traveling competition two years in Elko, Nevada, two years in Cortez, Colorado, two years in Williams, Arizona. The reason they made it a traveling competition, they didn't want the home team to have an advantage every year, so they wanted to rotate it so there'd be new people at the new spots that could be be as good or better. And then there was the Midwest, um, and that was out of St. Francis, Kansas. So Rollins, Wyoming National was always the first weekend in November, the first weekend of December was always the Worlds, and that was at Elko, Nevada that year. And the first weekend in January was the Midwest in St. Francis, Kansas. Now, that year, we just set out. I set out with my brother. We won the National. Just We won. I think it was 12 Coyotes we won. Um, is that a is that a, a one day or a two day? It's a day and a half. Okay. And you've got to check in that first day by 7 o'clock. You have to come in. All Coyotes are temperature probed. You had to have blocks in them. Uh, had to have your team number and the number of coyote it was with the date or the time you killed it. And I believe I, he even started saying if it was rifle or shotgun. And and you had to have that wood block in there and it was sent shut. Yep, and yep. then, um, so my brother and I won that with 12 coyotes in a day and a half. And then I wasn't going to go to the world. I never even really ever thought about it. And a guy contacted me, said, hey, I'm going to the worlds. I've got it pretty nice area and I just want to know if you want to hunt it with me and so I went out there I said yeah I'll do it and I went out there we scouted um I went and I made two stands I drove through everything I looked it all over in my eyes I was like yeah we could win this thing it looks good and we got about 10 miles away I said I just want to make a quick stand and just see if I can call one in and I made a stand and had a big white one come up like right in front of me on a hill we never even took guns I didn't want to shoot at it or nothing and we just sat there and watched it and then it just turned and left after a while so we went in there the first day I think we killed 11 and then we killed nine so we killed 20 coyotes we won that hunt and then we went to the midwest my brother and I again and we won that with 10 so three three states four and a half days of calling killed 42 coyotes um, 
I wasn't setting out to try to win them. But after I won the world, I like, geez, I won two of them in a row. We just will try to win the last one. And then we ended up winning. Um, so then it was like, holy crap, I won the three big ones. And then they, uh, Norm, the guy that run the national, he said, well, you're a triple crown champion. So the next year he had a silver plate made for me. First triple crown champion, uh, coyote caller. So that's kind of where the triple crown came from was winning all three of the big ones, you know? Yep. So that's, so run us through kind of your mindset on those when you're going in. I mean, physically, it's it's a somewhat, it's got to be somewhat physically demanding. How how from the time you're you're getting out of your truck to the time you're getting to point B, which is your set. I mean, you you I'm since we don't do competition, we've done a couple just just local stuff with our date with our light. We don't really travel around much, but how fast were you getting from out of your truck to your set? How much time would you give a coyote to respond before you're like, all right, we're out. We're going to go to another spot. Just so guys know. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, typically, <laughs> well, I'm a, I was an ex high hurdler in track. See, likewise that. Yeah. <laughs> good. So you could cover, we got yeah. a buddy that's like, you cover some ground then. Yeah. I walk fast, but see my brother ran track, uh, uh in college and he went to nationals in the 800. So I mean, if <laughs> you're anybody, in trouble, I, you're I, in, me, yeah. me and him are like freaking hauling butt, but, uh, usually the mindset, like I'm in a zone and I talked about this earlier, like I get in a zone, like I don't even drink or eat the whole day. Like when I get done, I'm shot. And then I've got to go to bed that night and then hit it hard the next. And I'm very, very hard on myself. Like, I can't miss a coyote. I get mad. And I'm not mad at nobody else. I'm mad at myself because I know what I'm good at doing. And so my equipment, everything's got to work the way it's supposed to. So usually, even like when my brother and I, uh, like in the national, when we kill 12 coyotes, we have 12 opportunities and we, we got every one. That's usually how we rolled. Um, the guys that had 12 opportunities and only got six, they, they could have been right up there with, but then it's, it's up here is where it's at, you know, and that's a big part of it. So I take pride in my shooting and that was my goal on the rifle side. I'm, I'm the killer when it comes to rifling and my brother's the shotgun and out of all the shotgun coyotes in competition, my brother's only missed one coyote that got away one. And it was a big white male. And that thing was so beautiful when he come in, we were sitting high and he come in and a draw below us. So he was shooting straight down on top of him with that 10 gauge. And it never got like when he pulled the trigger, I just thought, well, this guy was dead. I I wasn't up on my rifle, nothing. And he said, Les, I thought he was dead. I don't know how he didn't die. And then he run and he shot again, shot again, <laughs> shot again, you know, but that's how it goes, you yeah. know? Um, but typically that's why we were good in competition. We, we started the shotgun thing. We were, we always carried shotgun from clear back when I learned to call coyotes. We, we've always been shotgunners and, um, he, he was always ahead of me and a little bit to the downwind, um, for that coyote that would come in, at, you know, coming in at hundred and then starts to skirt a little bit. And then he, they wouldn't even know he was there and just one shot, boom, you know, done. Now there was times in the national we won with 10 coyotes he killed eight of them with shotgun, you know, and I'd, I'd make two good running shots on, you know, doubles that were with them. And that's what won the competition. So the shotgun always, always paid for itself, you know? So you would go from, from when you guys went into your sets, would you run? No, we wouldn't run. Fast we walk. just walk. Yeah. We walk fast and hard. And Was your mindset, the more sets you can make, the better off you are. And, and sorry, I didn't answer that. Yeah. It, it, it it was when we were in good stuff, yeah. um, w- when they were reacting. Um, I- I'm I'm big on the fact that if one coyote comes in, another one will somewhere else. So we got to hurry up and get to the next stand. Yep. And I always, in competition, I'm about that 12 to 15 minute guy. Um, unless I was sitting in such a good spot that I knew it demanded at least 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, um, I over the years. I, in my brain, I've never kept track of it, but I would say 50% of your coyotes are coming in in the first 
eight minutes. And then you're going to have 30% that come in from eight to 12, 13 minutes. And then you're going to have 20% that come from that longer. So I'm after the higher percentage coyotes. Sure. But as a person, so many people sit down and they play the call. They think, well, that was 15 minutes. We're out of here when it was actually only six minutes. Yeah. It's yeah. easy to say that it was 15 minutes and it's not, yep. you know. And then you you hit, say you hit a successful spot to where you hit the next spot. How far do you usually travel? Sometimes we wouldn't go 400 yards. If we killed one here and the wind was blowing like this, we'd just go two, 300 yards upwind and try it again. And, and a lot of times we'd pay off. Now, one of the teams that was in it, the Schmidt brothers, he asked me one time, he's like, Les, h- how do you know, you know, when you're in a good spot? I said, Tom, I said, when we kill a coyote, as soon as we kill one coyote, I know there's more coyotes because yeah. they, they travel through the country together. When they howl, how many times you hear just one lone howl coyote? You right. hear some over there, some over there, some back there. They're always within earshot of each other. So I said, try that. I said, if you kill one coyote, just go this way from that coyote, half mile, make another stand, go that way. Because he was confused on... And this guy's, him and his brother have won competition, but he wanted to pick my brain on it. So I told him that, and he said, you know, you're not going to believe this, but we were riding down a two-track on the four-wheeler. We come over a hill, coyote right in front of us, mousing around, got off, shot him, went, made a stand, killed another one, went to the other side, killed another one. They made four stands, killed three coyotes. He said, so evidently that worked. But, you know, who knows? That could have been luck too, you know. What do you see the differences, like, state to state state to state um my eyes i what i like i like like even coming up here i'm just like drooling you know i'm just like holy cripes i could kill coyotes i you know um sometimes the sound makes a big difference like i've down around cortez colorado i found out that on the Navajo Nation down there, those coyotes, they like a higher pitch bird distress or a higher pitch cottontail. Now, virtually everywhere I go, I call, I'm way deep and raspy. I'm more deep and raspy than anything. And I've never had a problem calling coyotes anywhere, anywhere. It's been the same the way I call. But down there, I struggled in New Mexico in that area, that Northwest uh, Mexico and Arizona had to go higher pitch too. And it's just what they're used to, I suppose, sure. you know. So we've done it on a podcast. I, I've tried to paint a picture for guys of what we look for getting into a set. Why don't you do that for some of the guys that are – if you're going to go into a set, say – say do it, do it both ways. Say that you're going to go into a set for a coyote – for a competition. You have limited time, what you're looking for, and then say you and your brother are going out and you're filming, you want to get some high-quality footage – What are you looking at for a picture-perfect set from that angle, too? Okay, that's a great question. Typically, in the West here, we have a lot of hills. So typically, when I call somewhere, I like to be higher on the hill. I don't ever sit on top of the hill, but whenever I come over a hill, I want to see maybe a drainage out there somewhere, some kind of a little draw or something, and I try to position it so that draw can come right to me. Um, whether it's, um, you know, if you're in Eastern Montana and you've got some bad lands and that there's a draw that comes up out of that stuff comes right to you. You want to, a lot of times you want those coyotes to have an Avenue to get right to you. Um, that's important. But when I'm in, when I'm going into the country, uh, in a, in a competition setting, I want to set a little bit higher where I can see a little bit better. And I want to know that, okay, from that spot, I want to try to plan my next spot. I'm always, I, I, I always scan, and especially if I hear coyotes howling, clear off in the distance, I'm ready. My brain is just working overload where I got to go next and where I got to go next. And I'll plan the whole day. Many times, my brother and I, during the national, we'd pull up on a spot to call. And I, I can tell you this, I can remember it vividly. We pulled up on this hill and the wind started blowing so hard before the sun come up. It was just just rocking the pickup, 60 mile an hour at least. And we were going to start right there. And I said, we got to get the heck out of here. So I just took off driving to get lower, you know, clear down. Because we were high desert, we mm-hmm. needed to get to lower desert. 
and we took off and we, and what do you do? You know, you had that planned and then you knew, okay, we can make this stand, that stand. That's the way I rolled, man. I had other backup spots in my mind and we just took off driving and then we're getting there to the first stand late, which is, is what happens. But, but even from a filming standpoint, that's kind of how we got to be. We got to, we got to set higher where we can get that good footage and, and see that coyote come and to tell the story, you know, but in a competition to the world. And I can remember this plain as day. And this was in 99. We were close to some tall, tall sagebrush. I'm talking that stuff that was as tall as us, six feet tall sagebrush. And I said, there's coyotes in that script crap I want to go stand in it and call so I I stood in one and I made sure I had a cow trail coming right to me and I had my 10 gauge never even took the rifle we stood in there he my partner took a shotgun and we never took no rifle we walked in there I went and I just sat there and this coyote come running in so fast it run in 10 yards and when it circled right facing me it wheeled went right back through itself and leaving and I had to shoot into the sagebrush and I just drilled that coyote but that took three minutes and I killed a coyote but that's what I do in competitions I call the stuff that nobody would ever think about calling so many times my brother and I we'd get down on a river when it was blowing 40 mile an hour we call the willows and we'd call here, we'd go right up 200 yards, call it again, call again. And I, I can't tell you how many show up at 10 yards, right? Because they got to get out of the wind too. They hate the wind. You yep. Know? Yep. That's cool. Do, do you study much on, I mean, there's a, we're trying to get somebody on here that's more the less of a, of a biologist. Mm -hmm. So they, somebody that's actually GPS or radio collared coyotes and, and tried to, I mean, from from what we do, the the elk you can kind of pattern a herd of elk. Yeah, going for, if they're going to come into a pivot, you're you're going to find their trail and do it. Yep. But a coyote's so erratic in their movement. Sure, they have bedding areas, and like you said, they they don't want to be in the wind. They'll yep. get down, they'll get out, and and most guys that that know what the hell they're doing, like you, are, you're going to figure that out. Have you seen certain areas uh, in certain? Uh, regions where coyotes uh, where you're trying to get them you know get in where they're bedded a little bit more or, or if they stay on in certain areas more than other areas or are you just kind of going through and looking for I know everybody's brain works a little bit different but are you just primarily looking for good spots where like you said you've got you got depending on the wind depending on the layout you've got elevation here you have a draw here you got a you got a fatal funnel you got a coyote that's going to come up in front of you in your mind and you're going to kill him but over the whole course of your career have you been able to pattern coyotes to any extent other than coming into a call no i can't say i can't say that i have i mean as far as that goes um, I just know what they like. I feel like, you know, I'm right there with them. You, you can, you, you're, you, like you said, all right, if there's coyote crap here or you're just like, this area is good. We're, I guarantee you, we're going to get in and kill a coyote. They're yeah. going to be here. That's kind of what you're And a lot of guys just have a, have a, you know, they, they can tell that. We, uh, I want to tell you, and this is another secret. Don't tell <laughs> I'll get through. <laughs> we're getting into it now. <laughs> Several times in competition, several, my brother and I are struggling on where we're going to make the first stand of the morning because we don't know. We're just going, you know. The wind may have been wrong at the first set, whatever, and I don't booger Kai. I don't go in. If the wind's wrong, I'm out, right. you know. Yeah. We're yeah. the same way. Yeah. So yeah. we're driving down the road, and one of the biggest, write it down, get your pen and paper out. If you come across scat on the edge of the road and it is pitch black, it's dark, it's fresh, you pull over right there. He's either on that side of the road or that side, but usually you can walk right up there and see his tracks. And I've done that numerous times. I just pulled over right where I seen scat. And if it was CRP on this side of the road, one time in Kansas, I did that in the Midwest and it was nothing on this side, just a wide open wheat field. I walked right out into that um, CRP and that thing came in so hard, just bouncing, just like a deer running in. And when I shot with the shotgun, I blew his bottom jaw off. I mean, that's how hard it come in. But the scat was right there. Usually they take their crap, and then they go lay down. 
and it happened in the Midwest. Uh, we were hunting Colorado, same thing. Great big male. I think we tied for big male on that, 40 pounds or 42 pounds. But that thing came in slinking, probably because he heard us driving down the road. And we just wheeled over, and that took 15 minutes for him to come in, but he was just as cautious as cautious got. And I had to work him, work him, work him, and he finally come in, and I shot him at about 100 yards. But, but that's if they're scat, you know, yep. right on the road. Yep. Yeah. Or, yeah. You, you, or if we're driving around you, you, for Colin too, Colin more kick it off. Yeah. <laughs> kick it off. So nobody else yeah. sees it. <laughs> yeah. He'll pull over and kick it off the side of the road. You <laughs> remember uh, years and years ago, this is clear back in the eighties. You know, my dad will tell me this. Well, I read a story where a guy in Oregon, he'd, he'd go around and he'd locate coyotes and he'd ride on a rock, you know, three coyotes and, put the arrows and then he'd put the rock on the side of the road. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come back later in the day and say, well, there's three of them out there somewhere. No kidding. <laughs> no that's kidding. Pretty, that's pretty good. I, I, well, I think it's pretty interesting though. I didn't know that you guys were, were, I mean, well, I, you can tell by just by looking at you that you're athletes, but it's the same, same thing as us. We are we're all basically college athletes and I, I, it's, it's not to put somebody against somebody else, but it makes, doing what we do uh i think it gives you more success if you're if you're if you're an athlete it, not only being able to maybe acclimate to a certain position and change your shooting positions but it's uh i mean don't get me wrong that, that's just another question i was going to ask you but uh it, it it helps you get from point a to point b more efficiently you're trained for it you're you whether you're genetically like that or you make yourself like that to an yeah. extent but it also being an, an athlete helps you handle the rifle, handle the shotgun, handle the whole situation so much better than somebody that's not. Yeah. And I'm not downplaying anybody because you can, if you want to do it bad enough, you can make yeah. yourself be that way. But uh, is there anything that you've done? Like we shoot a lot. I mean, we get, uh, this year might be a little bit different with the the, the shortage of, of ammo. I've kind of liked to, stockpile and keep a little bit yeah. shit hit the fan scenario yeah. but did you do any kind of training any kind of a lot of shooting other than just shooting a lot of coyotes to get to you know some of this this specific skill set it's it's most guys are going to be how in the hell do you make shots like that you have to be repetitive and do it over and yeah. over and over and over and a lot of guys will never be able to do that they just you know it might be a weekend deal for them yeah. Might be once every two weeks that they get to pull a trigger, so that takes them out of the equation right there. Is there anything in particular that you did to hone some of those skills that you've acquired, other than just freaking killing coyotes? Absolutely, you know that's a a very very good question, James. Um, obviously, you know your first coyotes that come in, a anybody can say, how can they miss? I mean, when there's a heartbeat on that animal. It, I don't care. You shot thousands. You're still excited. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, care yeah. how many you've killed. You still get excited. And the thing for me, when we were competition shooting, I've always shot Harris bipod and I've had a ton of people want me to use their bipod, that bipod, this bipod, just had a guy write me, said he developed a new one and liked to see me write, uh, use it. Once you get to a point where you're successful with one kind, you stick with that kind. Because as soon as you change, it's just like a trigger pull, whatever. It changes everything. For me, before a competition, I would go out in a, a cut beam field, and I would take gallon milk jugs, and they all have a flat spot on the one side. And I'd use, I, I'd either put a, uh, put a sticker there, or I'd use a magic marker and just try to draw a black circle there and kind of scribble it in a little bit fill it half full of water, and I'd, I would not range. I would not do anything. I'd just take off walking, and I'd put one down over there. Then I'd go clear out there, and I'd put one down and one over there, and I would mark them, you know, one, two, three, four. And then I'd have my brother. I'd go, and I would be in a calling situation with just my back not up against anything. I would just have – I'd be laying back on my elbow just like I'm calling a coyote and put my, my rifle up on the bipod. And then he would say two, and I'd pull up, get on two as fast as I could, just try to steady, boom, boom. And I don't know how far it was. We wouldn't range it until we were done. But I always shot. Uh, I sight in my rifle 
inch and three quarter high at a hundred. I always did that. And then once you leave Nebraska, you go on West, you got to check them because it's way off, way off. So I'd rather shoot high. I, I, my, my, my other big thing, and I want people to hear this, you always, when in doubt, always hold dead on, always. We, we love to say, I bet that thing's 400 yards, and then you shoot over it. It's like, mm-hmm. whatever, come on. Yep. You know, it's so easy to shoot yep. over a coyote. We, we all have done it. Yeah. I, yeah. I held over him, gosh dang it. Yep, <laughs> yep. So that's the big thing, and I did that. I, I liked doing it because it put pressure on me to make the shot fast. So then I had to learn how to settle the crosshair in as soon as it got on, boom. And see, there's a lot of people that probably squeeze the trigger, do that. I don't. I jerk my trigger. I just, as soon as I'm on it, boom, I'm just fast. You know what I mean? But once you get in your way, that's the way you shoot, you know? That's, you, that's, that's the way to say it too, because it's just like the same. I say this to, say to a lot of guys. It's just like baseball or 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 track. There's there's a, a a way that should be fundamentally sound that might not work for you. You that you might have shitty running form, but you might be able to beat that guy's yeah, ass yeah. that has really good running form. You ju- it's the same way with rifles. These guys that and nothing against anybody, but you you go say say for example, you went to boot camp where there's guys that have never touched a rifle in their life. Some of these kids that are coming in 18 years old that are coming from out of the city that you, you have to teach them some fundamentals. Yeah. But guys like you or us that we've been around it are from probably the first memories that we have of holding a gun uh, just because, like, like your trigger pull deal. I mean, that when guys hear that that are long range, they're like, no, that's not right, dude. Well, have them come do what you do yeah. and tell you that. Yeah, That's what's pretty cool. The way I like to say, you yeah. know, put stuff into perspective like that, just because your the way that you run a gun or the way that you do things is definitely not, doesn't apply to a lot of other guys. That's, that's really cool. That's, that's awesome to hear stuff like that. So, and, and going into the, that, there, there you go. For guys that, that see how easy someone like you makes it, Look at what you've done through your whole life. Just just that with the milk jug deal. How many yeah. guys know about that? Yeah, not many, I don't think. I don't know. I mean, that's cool. That goes yeah. to show you have to, no matter what, no matter how good people that make it look easy have put in a hell of a lot of work to make it, to get to that point. Yeah. That's what's cool, to be able to hear stuff like that. That's that's really cool. Um, Regarding, you know, let's just let's talk about your, your, let's talk about caliber preferences. For since we're talking kind of about yeah. rifles, what are some of the things we get into some, I don't know, some, some, I don't, I wouldn't say heated discussions. I don't care what anybody uses, but there's guys that are like, oh, you got to use this caliber. Oh, you got to use that caliber. I, I'm a firm believer that shot placement is key, yeah. but there's also bullet selection for like we were talking about earlier. If you want to try to keep furs, you probably want to either have really good shot placement which if you have a, a bullet that's going to do a lot of damage, you don't always have a chance to make proper shot placement, especially on a high-speed animal like a coyote. You know, yeah. coming in, running, you yeah. can't no. put that bullet exactly, hey, man, I don't want to wreck the fur. I'm going to shoot him while he's hauling ass away in a spot that ain't. So talk to us about what you like over the years. So I don't care if you work with certain companies, yeah. whatever. We're not tied to any one person. What, what are some, for the guys that are listening, what do you like to use and why? You know, the crazy thing is I've shot the same bullet clear back from the early 90s, late 80s that I'm still using now. I, I blow some holes, but it is a killer. Like clear back in the day, I'd keep track. If I killed 100 coyotes, I, I, I would have four get away, and that was because they were 350, and I hit just a little low and took out the front yep. leg, yep. and it didn't hit the rib cage, so it took that front leg out, and – or they were running away and I shot a little bit low and, and I hit them in the back ham or something where it didn't, didn't, didn't anchor them down. So out of 100 coyotes, I would only have four get away. And that was with the 52 grain boat tail hollow point match bullet. Now, I, I've, I, I've just 
pounded so many coyotes in competition. Now, I had a custom gun built for competition, a 6 millimeter ot 6 but that thing will blow a coyote in half. You know what but, I mean? But in a competition, you don't care. No, no, but I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't need it. My 250 did the same thing. You know what I mean? I, I, got, I was so proficient with my 250 that I, it was just one of me. You know, when I'd pull up and shoot, I was on it. And there were times, I mean, if I missed a coyote, I'd tell my brother, I said, Jeff, this, I, I was rock solid. That coyote was dead when I pulled the trigger. And I said, I missed him. I got to shoot my gun. And I'd be shooting three inches high and four to the right for whatever reason. Yep. Yep. And, and then we would just, we would, I would shoot at a fence post and get it right back down to where I think it need. I'd only take a couple shots. I'd just screw it over, screw it down. Okay, that's good. I'll be good, you know. And, and then it's up here, you know. Yep. But um, the 22 250 uh, it, it, with that combination, but there's, there's a kicker point to it. They had to be hand loaded, obviously. But I was shooting max, uh, max velocity. Uh, and it's about 3650 to 3680 feet per second. So you were, you were reloading? Yeah. Okay. And, cool. and I measured every grain. I mean, 36 grains on the mark. And if there was 36.1, uh-uh, I trickled it out. Yep. I was anal about my yep. hand loads. Yep. Anal. And... That's why I got so good at running shots because I knew that I, I I knew everything about that bullet and yeah it would blow some holes but man it would just kill those guys. You have to shoot that load fast because it's a match hollow point and it's a hard one. So when it goes in, you got to be going fast and then it just it's like throwing a hand grenade in them. Yep. You know. Yep. If you shoot it slow, if you shoot it thirty two hundred, it's just going to go through like a full metal jacket. It won't do nothing. Yep. And I've had other people shoot one coyote with less. That bullet's no good. I'm like, yeah, yeah you're telling me no good. And I've <laughs> shot thousands. Exactly. Yeah. You know? yep. That's just it. Come on. Yep. You know, so that's my favorite. I've killed a lot with the 204. I've killed quite a few with the uh, 243. Um, I've shot them with, you know, the 204. I love that with a 32 grain bullet. It's so freaking accurate. And, then I wasn't moving much with my running shots. It was pretty much the same lead and everything. Yep. And going back to the trigger pull, that's why I got to be good on running shots because y- y- you can't just slowly squeeze. Right when you got on, boom, you had to make that shot right at the precise time. Yep. You know? So your you you're, you're, you're 204 and your 250 are, were kind of your more, you, you like those caliber, those cartridges the best. I'm I'm a speed guy. I yeah. Like speed. Oh yeah. You know what I mean. Oh yeah. You back, you back in the day, every every rancher had a two twenty Swift. Yeah. You know. Yep. And the, you heard all of them. Oh, this is a coyote killing son of a gun because they're accurate. They're just like the two fifty. You yep. know. And in speed is it is it's it's your like you you're max point blank range. You sight in high at a hundred and you're good till oh, as geez. far as you're comfortable. Yeah. And just you, hold dead on. Like done. I said, when in doubt, hold dead on, and you're going to smoke that guy. Because yep. even at 340 yards, you're probably only losing uh, four to five inches, maybe six. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I mean, if you hold on top of his back, it's done. just going to drip right in. Yep. Him, yep. You okay. know? And that's what we kind of do. Some of these advancements in optics that have yep. the reticle system in them, yep. we're, we, we're the same way. Our goal, even though we have these rifles designed for long range, our goal is to get them as close, close as we yeah. can get them. Yeah. 50 yards, 20 yards, yeah. until yeah. you see them kind of kink back and like, hey, man, that's, we better do it. Yeah. That's, that's interesting on your, on your caliber. So, so what would you say you're, you're, if you were going to grab your gun and go flat out do everything with it, what's your go-to coyote gun caliber, cartridge? It's twenty two two fifty. That's, that's my your go-to. Favorite. Yeah, yep. and I've heard a lot on this, uh, the six Creed and the – 22 Creed, I'd love to try them, but see my, then you're slowing it down, Mm -hmm. then I wouldn't be as good on my running shots, because see, I've went from a 223 and missed coyotes on the run that I would have smoked with my 250. Yes, big difference, yeah. Then I I go back to my 250, and I'm I'm shooting in front of them, you know what I mean? Yes, yes, And then it takes me four or five coyotes to get back in my groove, and you can't have that, like, especially with filming even though i'm filming coyotes my goal is to kill them i don't yeah. i don't people are like well you don't show any misses because there's not very many yeah. misses yeah. you know yeah. people 
people don't understand that, you know, and I, and I'm not saying it to brag. I miss coyotes. There's no doubt. Just like when I met Cal the other day, um, this last weekend, he said his goal is nine out of 10 coyotes. That's what I'm at. That's right where I'm at too, you know? Exactly. And if you're good, it just, it's, Hey, it's a fact of the matter. If you're a major league pitcher, guess what? You're probably going to throw more strikes than balls. Yes. It's the same damn thing. And and you got to have it up here. There comes a point in time in life when you, you, you can either be sitting on the couch doing something or you can be making yourself better. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, yep. And maybe that's why more guys want to watch you do more videos. They'd rather sit on the couch and watch somebody do it. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier. Yeah. yeah it makes them feel it. better, you know? Absolutely. That's, <laughs> what do you think about the suppressor deal? You said you've more than more recently than not have got into that game. Yeah. What do you think? T- go, go through that. Tell us what you think about that deal. Well, the, the whole thing was suppressor. I, I held off and I held off and I held off because I wanted to be different. I wanted to be the guy shooting the noisy gun yet, you know, and I didn't want to be that guy that looked cool. And, and I had I have a cover on my suppressor. As soon as I aired, I had a guy saying, what, you trying to be cool? What is yeah. that on your suppressor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just like, holy yeah. crap. I Come mean, on, where's that? Yeah. You know, that thing shines like a beacon out yeah. there if you don't have it covered up, yeah. you know. And, and so starting to shoot with the suppressor, I actually started flinching pretty bad because it was so quiet that I was expecting that. Oh, boom. you know gotcha. what I mean? Oh yeah. I got gotcha. you. I would jerk. Yeah. I, and yeah. I missed easy coyotes, easy coyotes because I was, it, it just was, it just mentally. Yeah. Something new, something there. different. Yeah. Oh, totally. But I would never go back, you know, because I've killed so many multiples. Now you shoot one this way and you keep calling, you call one this way. And, yeah. And I've killed so many coming from the same direction. I killed a triple, one of these last trips, it was quick. I had a big one come in. It was a big old female, and I smoked her. And it was only like three minutes into the call, kept calling. Then I had two come from the same direction where I just shot, and I smoked both of them, you know. And I would have never got those had I had not a suppressor on. I would never have killed them, you know. I would have killed one, and that would have been it. Yeah, know? that's – how. when did you start running a can? I, it, this last year was a first year filming, but the year before is my first year with a can. Getting it going. What you do know, you, what is it? What do you? Thunder Beast. Yeah. Ultra seven. Yeah. We, yeah. your brother ordered one of those. Thunder Beast makes that lightweight, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. Really easy to, yeah. are you working with those guys? They, they will not sponsor me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. the re, here's the thing, you know, and, and we could go into all that stuff, you know, I love them to death. They were nice enough to give them to me, yeah. which, hey, I've sold some for them. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> that I know, but they they tell me they don't need to advertise. Yeah, so, I we 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 run into that a lot. I mean, here what what it's it's there's a there's a point there where you get into it. There you, there's so many companies out there. They'll they'll give you something, and and it's kind of hard on your end with what you've done to go, well, you got to weigh the pros and cons. You got to weigh the benefits and the doubts where you're, you're going to be running one of their, one of their pieces of equipment and you're going to be making a lot more money for them than what you're getting in return. And you've just got to be content with it. Yeah. And and I guarantee you, you've went through that way before we ever did. And maybe we'll talk about that here, but I'll, I'll talk to you about suppressors. I wouldn't mind. We, we'd, we'd be interested in working with you on some stuff. I mean, gosh dang, we we kind of developed one that's specifically catered to a a, a what we do precision yeah. and optimal sound sound performance sound suppression, and uh, I, I'm I'm all about I mean working with guys that are interested. It'd be it'd be I don't know. I, I was just kind of curious as to what what you were using, and I saw you using. It, I just wasn't sure what it was or whose it was. The manufacturer. You, you like them though. They're good. I mean, well, and, and the thing is, you know, we could go into the television and we need to just to let some people know what it's all about. But no matter what, when you get your product out in front of people, it, and it's not about huge dollars, it's about supporting the industry because it, it costs me money to be on TV. So if I'm doing a good thing for this industry, why not help? when you're on back order for a year 
and, and you're buying a new Jeep and a new Lamborghini and, you know, you still got to keep your name out in the public or people forget who you are. What happens in five years if sales dry up all of a sudden and then guys are yeah. like, no, he wasn't, I never even heard of that one, you know, yep. but they'll remember it. And it's about keeping the industry alive, you know, because no matter what you, you've got to get your name out there, you know, no matter what, you know, so so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the the some of your experiences, good or bad. Not not really in, not really name names. Yeah. But just out of respect, when you started and you got into the film side of things, was that an idea that all of a sudden, boom, you're like, oh man, we're we're we can kill coyotes. Let's just do it on video. Or did you have somebody go, hey, you should be doing this. Consider it. Well, I had a a buddy of mine. And he started competing in competition about 95, and he was from Colorado. Big dude, ex-military. He laid carpet for a living. He could put a whole roll of carpet on his back and go in just a big, you know, and that's kind of my niche of who I hang out with, guys that are able to do a lot and, and driven, you know. And he kept pestering me, he wanted to go hunting with me. Because he was the guy I was telling you about that was taking the league, playing the Sunrise Serenade, had the perfect yep. ranch. Yep. And he wanted to go call his ranch, see how I'd hunt it, you know. And uh, he kept pestering me. Les, will you take me calling? I said, no, I ain't, I ain't taking you calling. Well, finally, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll lay brand new carpet in the whole level of your house, the main level. And I said, what do I got to do for you? Take me one day. I said... You know, and that would have been, that was 2,500 back in the day because it was really nice carpet. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll take you. So he came up from Colorado, <laughs> did my carpet. We go out, we kill three coyotes that day. It's 40 mile an hour winds. And the last coyote, the last coyote, it was cold. It was probably pushing 25, 30 below zero. And the sun or the wind died down at last stand of the evening. And we snuck in. And there's a ton of antelope wintering right there. And we sneak in, and we're facing kind of to the southeast because the wind was blowing that away at first. And I sat down, and I felt the wind hit me in the back of the neck. And I got up, and I said, we got to walk west. We got to get away from this. The wind just swirling bad. So we walked about three, 400 yards west. And as we are walking, there's a huge herd of antelope. And they just take off running out in front of us, running around. And I was like, well, we've got to get out because we don't want to lure anything. We sat down, and there's a big rim over there, and a, co uh, a old male, he just howled right there. Right when we got set down, he was up on that side hill, probably three-quarters of a mile away or a mile away. And I'm like, yeah, he knows we're here probably is what the deal was. So I shouldn't tell you this either, but I went into a sound that I don't show very often, and... Virtually every time I use it, I kill a coyote or I call in a whole pack. And a lot of times I can kill two, three, four of them. But all I do is I start kai-eyeing. And then try to sound like that antelope. And then I go back to kai eye and I just go crazy. And then I just shut up. And we're looking to the west and that thing quit howling. And a lot of times I'll be letting them howl that second time. Like, they'll howl the first time, and then they'll start howling again. So right when they're howling, I just start tie eyeing And then I'll hear them just shut up because then I know they're like, what the heck? Yeah. And I kept watching the antelope. And then I just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bah, bah. And pretty soon I saw the antelope just take off, hauling butt, running. And I go, yep, you're coming in, buddy. And I just kept watching, and I told my buddy that was with me, I said, he's going to show up right here, right on that knob, right in front of us, about 350 yards. It was just a bald clay knob, and uh, he's filming. Sure enough, here comes that coyote. He just, as soon as you turned away, you look back, there he stood, right there. And I just let him stand there, and he's just looking. And he got so impatient, he's like, kill him. I'm on him. Kill him. And I finally kept saying, I just turned and said, shut up. And I just let that coyote look around. And he's just still looking. But he's kind of knowing something's goofy. So I just, 
here he come, and he went down a draw right beside me, and the wind's going this way, but I had a shooting lane. So he disappeared in one, and he come out. And uh, as soon as he come out, I lip squeaked. He stopped about 150-yard shot and smoked him. And uh, we got that coyote. We got all the footage. We're froze. My boots were just froze like uh, a block of ice, you know, because it was so cold. We get back to the pickup. We're driving, and I asked him, we were probably 20 miles into it going home. We're just, both of us are just quiet because we're shot. We're physically wore out, 40 mile an hour winds all day. We killed three. It was a heck of a day. And uh, I said, what'd you learn today, Don? And he goes, Phew. he just let out a sigh, just gasping. Well, I drive by everything that you call because I think it don't look good enough to my eyes. He's the guy that pushed me to start my television show. So he started helping me film. He filmed enough. I made a pilot. I sent the pilot to Men's Channel. If you remember the Men's Channel, clear back in the day, they were on direct TV. Or yeah, TV. yeah, yeah. It was called Men's Channel. I sent a pilot to them. I sent one to Sportsman Channel. I sent one to Wild, uh, Wild TV in Canada. Wild TV, Sportsman's Channel both said, yep, we'll do it. Uh, Men's Channel, they didn't want blood gore yep, throwing yep. the coyote around they don't want none of that S said if you make some changes we'd do it i knew nothing about tv so i before i knew it i signed a contract and then it's like oh jeez, i better get sponsors well i didn't know it'd be that hard it was hard so at that time what were you looking at for the contract that you signed the the, the amount of money that was involved for your time slot 150 yeah no kidding. Because there was a lot of, oh, to be on TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're yeah. going to pay for it. Yeah. Now you can get airtimes cheaper, but some of that comes because you're a, a good personality that people, they yeah. want you because you bring views. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. So back then I got on television. I, I never had no sponsors. Like I was just shooting my old rebuilt, you know, my new barreled Remington action with a shilling barrel and, you know, I'd go to people and they were like, coyote calling, no, we aren't sponsoring you. Three years later, they're trying to get a hold of you, you know. Yeah. But it's, you know, a couple of years in a row, I lost 150000 a year just trying to pay all the air times. And, because I was there in a full year, too. Oh. I, I was producing 26 originals. Oh, Gosh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't know, I, even know that. I ran yeah. eight years, 26 or Oh, my gosh. That like to kill oh, me. Oh, shit. I was killing 150, 170 coyotes a year. Filming them. Yeah, oh, filming. Geez. And then, you know, that's hard when you're traveling all over. Oh, yeah, you know sure. I mean? Oh, you, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, that's was, hard when you're not traveling. Oh, yeah, You know? <laughs> and and then, you know, it, it just, uh, after eight years, then I went down to just 13 originals because the price, you just couldn't do it. Like sponsors like say they have they're allocating 40,000 to small game or predator from their budget they can't give you 30,000 because they need to be in predator extreme magazine yep, yep, this yep. magazine this ma you know so many other they can't give you the bulk of their their revenue so that's what you run up against you know they all want it for nothing but they know they're getting multiple the best yeah. eyes on yep. television. Yep. You know what I mean? So yep. so so now, like even this last time when I was with Hornady, I you know, I I have a great relationship with them. And, you know, he's like, What can I do to help you? You need more sponsors. I said, No. No. Well, how are you doing? I said, I got two sponsors. Well, how's that doing? I said, I'm not paying all my bills, but I love my life right now. Yeah. I let it make up for mass outfitters, my outfitting business. I sell some hunts. That gets me where I need to be. I'm totally content with not having to pump a bunch of other product, uh, when, products. When did know? that start? From the point where you decided, all right, less is more. Well, since I started airing again, so I aired 12 years and I, I had the rat race of having, you know, five, six, eight sponsors and trying to appease to all of them. 
So then I got burnt out. I mean, I hit major burnout. I never shot a coyote for a year and a half after that. I've never done that in my whole life, you know. And I was just so burnt out. I didn't even like, I'd drive by a coyote and wave at him, you know, if I seen him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's beyond me, man. <laughs> I'm like, normally I'm grabbing you're, for a gun. Yeah, or, yeah. You're, you're, you're lucky, dude. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, so then when I started refilming, I'm just like, I'm going to have more fun now. Yeah. So me and my brother have been having more fun and he's way laid back now. Like he's the one pushing me. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And I love that, you know, cause he was never that away. Yep. You know, usually it's me chewing on him. Let's go, you know? So we've killed a ton of coyotes and even like this year, our big thing is, you know, we always, we've skinned coyotes our whole life. We put them up, we've done all that, but like this year, I gave him all my coyotes. I helped him skin them all, and I just like, that's your bonus for helping me, man. And, you know, I can't say thank you enough, you know. And he loves being a part of it, you know. So, actually, today he was selling the coyotes. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they were all skinned, and that's what yep. he was going to do, sell them skinned. Yep. yep. Oh, that's interesting. So, staying on the TV thing in, in film, uh, who, who are some of the companies that you've worked with I mean, I don't know if you what what your agreements are, or if you can mention certain people or not. Who who you've worked with? Who have you who some of the companies? Some uh, who have you really enjoyed working with? Who what so, something some of the companies that stand out to you that you really enjoyed being a part of? Well, ultimately, number one is Hornady. They're thirty miles from me. Yeah, yeah, uh, makes sense. Yep. That's Jason Hornady. I go up to the office. He sees me, he flips me off. That's kind of yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah, got, yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah. He, he's like, Hey, peckerhead. What yeah, are you doing exactly. here today? I'm like, just to see you buddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, Hornady hands down, they're a Nebraska company. They're, they're all about people. It's those old, it, it, Virtually everybody that works at Hornady, their their turnover rate is zero. Like they, all them people been working there since they started working there. What's that tell you about a yep, company? Exactly. They, they don't need to go nowhere else. I want to tell you a story real quick about the just about what kind of quality of people Hornady is. You know, Steve Hornady and Jason Hornady. So Grant Nebraska is huge on tax. They loved taxes. Yep. Like our personal property taxes are out of control. We've got quarters in Nebraska, a quarter, 160 acres with a pivot on it, $12,000 a year on oh taxes. My it's ridiculous. Jeepers. Ridiculous. So they, they come to Hornady, you know, hey, uh, your employees, you're paying your employees, they're going out of town and spending all of their money. He says, no, they're not. They're shopping here in Grand. No, they're not. We want to raise your taxes. So this is how smart he is. So the one winner for bonus, for Christmas bonus, he paid everybody in $2 bills, gave their bonus in $2 bills. What happened the next week? Everybody in Grand Islands, where's all these two dollar bills coming from? Sure, sure. Yeah. It circulated yeah. the whole system. Yep. But to this day, they're still floating around up there. No kidding. Yeah. It, and the thing is, they've been with me since the beginning, and I've shot their stuff. That's what I won all the competitions with. I don't have to sugarcoat it. Yep. Yeah, I blow some holes in some coyotes, but I've always said they're dead. Yep. They aren't moving. They're dead. I have a few get away from me. That's just the way it is. That's that's the loss. But hands down, they're phenomenal. I've had Lucky Duck for two years. They've been great to me. I love where I'm at. I've got two sponsors. Capiche. I love it. But, uh, you know, the industry's hard. Um, it gave me a lot of gray hair. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to see you fail. I mean, I, I've had... I, it's it's been horrible horrible what people have done to me what they've tried to destroy me my reputation uh people can't handle the fact that a that i'm good yep. and i used to have a hard time saying that what i and i'm humble but i'm good i can kill more coyotes than most people can call in in the season you know and there's a difference between being flat out arrogant and being confident and yeah. if you're if you stack numbers like you do, you can be confident about yeah. it. So yeah, and you know, and it's just like 
a few years ago. It was like, you know, probably 2012, 2013. I killed the most coyotes in one day I've ever killed with my brother film. And I killed 16 that day. I killed uh, uh, 16. I killed seven with shotgun, nine with rifle. And to do it filming in wide open country, I mean, it just, you know, I've killed, you know, and the thing is, I've killed so many, I've killed 16s, 14s, 13s, 12s, 11s, 10s, 9s. Like this year on just a couple trips, I had 9 and 8 and 3 7s, you know. But that isn't my goal. My goal is to kill them if they come in, you know. It just so happens they're reacting good. But, But on television, when people hurl insults, try to insult me, on forums, on this, on that, people can either try to decipher it as somebody's jealous or they're going to say, you know what, he knows what he's doing. He's killing coyotes. You know what I mean? I didn't enter all the competitions to say, look at me, everybody, I'm the best. I, I entered them because I wanted to see how I could do and what I needed to do to become one of the best. And I, I want, it, you know, I want everybody to know that I put my heart, my soul, everything into it. And they can do it too. It's all a decision. And I've told so many people, like we talked about earlier, you can either sit on the couch or you can go make one stand. Because what I did back in the day, the wind let down, I drove 80 mile an hour to go make one stand. I might drive 20 miles to make one stand. Nine times out of 10, I killed a coyote on that stand. How many people are going to do that? Because you got to think, okay, the wind's out of the southeast today. What spot? We never get a southeast wind. What spot yep. can I yep. mark yep. that I've always wanted for a southeast wind? That's the way I think. But that that's a coyote caller thinking like that, you yep. know? Yes. We, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It <laughs> is. 100% it is. <laughs> we know exactly what you're saying on that. 100%. Do you ever do you, do you GPS your spots or anything? Do you? Just, no. Okay. I, I drive through, like, when my brother and I are going hunting, like I used to live in Wyoming for about seven years and we'd be driving through on interstate 80. I'd say I killed a double right here. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and I'd tell him the story. And I mean, I've just got so, I mean, what's cool is driving through the country and say, I killed one right over there, right over there. And I I can do that in Nevada. I can do that in New Mexico, everywhere, you know, we catch ourselves a lot of times. It's like, we got it. We need this win next year. You know, yep. next season, we're going to call this spot with this one. You know, we yep. catch ourselves a lot. Everywhere you go, it's looking for places to make a set. Oh, it, and you know, that, that was the fun part about being a custom harvester oh, because sure. I got to travel clear from Oklahoma to Montana and drive through all that country and go, my gosh, look at that stuff. Yep. Yep. Oh my God. I got to come back here. You know, that's the way it was. Yep. Yeah. That's interesting. That's where's some of the most fun spots that you've that, that you most enjoyable spots enjoyable. And, and I've always said to the tougher it is for me, the more I like it yep. because it pushes me. And one of the toughest areas I've ever called uh, over the years is, has been Shoshone, Wyoming, beautiful country, but they, they pound them hard there all summer long because there is some sheep herds yep. there yet and those those trappers follow the sheep and they just kill them summertime and they're always decoy dog and doing all that so when you get in say december or january them sucker you might make eight stands to call one coyote but when you call it in it is a beauty It'll, mo- some of the prettiest coyotes i've ever killed have come from there like it, it's hard to even explain how pretty they are they're just like when you kill one and walk up to it some of them like they are the best of the best but that's just like in eastern montana you can kill some freaking cream puffs but not going up there and just going out there you can see that like they're they're special um alberta i love calling alberta i haven't been up there for a lot of years um we'd go up there late february and in about seven days we'd kill between 45 and 55 coyotes in seven days wow but we're high rolling um my uh, the guy that i got in with he come up to me at a show at wild tv uh, Wild TV had what was called Hunt Fest. It was in uh, Edmonton where they had a get together, and then they had like Jim Shockey there. And I don't know if Jim was there, but they had numerous celebrities there talking about, you know, deer hunting, moose hunting, all that stuff, bear hunting. 
and Ralph and Vicky were there. I remember that. But at the end of the night, well, he come up to my booth and he he was a he took Bill Jordan, Spook Spawn, he, he took those guys whitetail hunting. So he was in the whitetail game and he knew big deer. He said, and he would just drive around in the winter and kill 150 coyotes. And he shot them all with a freaking 270 Weatherby mag. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, yeah. But he is a heck of a shot, man. He smoked those coyotes. He had video of them, 450 yards, see the vapor trail. Just smoke yep. them. Smoke them. And he said, I like what you're doing, Les. He said, you want to come up, you come up. I won't charge you, but I'll put you on coyotes. And that's what he did. Um, but... He'd say, where do you want to go? I said, just start driving, and when I see what I like, I'll tell you. And I'm not kidding. We'd be driving down the road 70 mile an hour. I said, Dave, go talk to that ranch right over there. And I'm not kidding. We, we would just annihilate coyotes. And it, it, it was almost to the point where you'd probably kill on four out of five stands. I don't even know if you'd have mm -hmm. one stand where you didn't call a coyote. And it was just learning to set there long because even in that really cold stuff, you guys know all about it. A lot of those coyotes just walk in because they're falling through the snow. Yep. They don't like that, and so many people get impatient. But when it's that cold, they can't even run either because they'll fry their lungs. They just take their time and yep. walk in. And yep. But Alberta's unreal, and I had a guy at a show there one time in Red Deer, Alberta. I gave a presentation. Then after that presentation, it was a three-day event. Then we went coyote hunting for seven days and a big old cowboy and he was leaned back in the chair and there's about 150 people in the presentation. And after he's done, he's chewing on a toothpick and had his cowboy hat down and he, legs crossed, you know, and I said, any questions? And he raised his hand and he goes, what sound are you going to be using when you're up here? Because I told everybody I was going to call. I said, I don't know. It's just a deeper, raspier sound, more like a jackrabbit. And he goes... I have news for you. There ain't no jackrabbits up here. And I said, well, that's what I call it. <laughs> he said, you ain't going to call nothing with that sound. And I said, yeah, I'll kill coyotes. And that's we did. We killed 45 <laughs> to 55. No kidding. In seven days, yeah. Jeez. But but here's the thing, too. And, and you know all about this. But I'd have people that live up there. They live up there. All winter long, kill barely kill twenty coyotes. You know what I mean? I was killing fourteen. The next day we'd kill eleven. Next day we'd kill twelve. And yeah, we'd we'd slow down one day because we're freaking shot. You know, it's always thirty below zero. And when you yeah. get in at night, you're wiped yeah. out, yeah. like drained. Oh, it, uh, you can't even explain it. Yep. Like you guys know that that cold takes it out of yeah, you. Yeah, it does. Yep. And uh, we're tromping through knee deep snow, trying to get out to a stand, and but. But so many people, A, they're playing too loud. They're not sitting long enough. They're they're too close to their pickup. Like, you can just write those things down, and that it's one of those, or two of them, or three of them. Yep. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's – that's uh, those – I would say, I bet you 99% of those coyotes were good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were unbelievable. How's this year been – or last year? Have you been seeing – we have that neck lice here that I don't know if they call it like a clipping lice. Some of them coyotes will be plumb good from, from the back of the shoulders all the way down, look like nothing's wrong. And then you, you flip them over, you look at the top, and it's so thin. You, you can't do nothing with them. Yeah. Have you been running into – no. No, we don't. I heard the sand hills in Nebraska had mange pretty bad. Yeah. Like, it, it, they're not terrible, but everyone was pink in the crotch. Yeah. A lot of them are bald, they're losing their, their fur. Like – I haven't killed – I, I left one lay, you know, this year, but not bad at all. No kidding. So, yeah. And you're going from where to where, would you say, your range is I, for filming and killing? Filming and killing, uh, we killed quite a few in Nebraska, a lot north-central Kansas, uh, southwest Kansas, eastern Colorado. Really? Yeah. This year we stayed fairly close. A lot of it is just trying to – I, I, I really can't go where it's 20 and 30 below just yeah. because when I go that far, 800 miles or whatever, and then we try to film in it, it's just harder for us. So yep. we try to stay where it's not so yep. Yep. terribly cold, you know? Yeah. We, we killed, I bet not quite another half as many as we got skinned and, and finished, but another, 
an, at least another third of what we killed that just had that that wow. yeah, bad. It was, it was right, probably our worst year, right for, here. For any of that mange or that mite or whatever. Just wow. out, just out here in our cabin lot. I bet you there's close to a dozen of them still laying out there that just we wouldn't pick. Wow. Just it's, it's a bummer deal. Yeah, it is. Especially if you're hunting for. It's like God, we. Yep. If we'd have got them a month ago, you know. Yep. Wow. So it's just one of those things. I don't know. Now they they used to have it really bad up in Canada and Saskatchewan. And it worked its way out. Well, from what I heard, some of it did, but they still have a little bit. Now, I don't know how you get rid of that stuff. Yeah. I don't either. It's it's just one of those. There's different years here. Some years it's really good. Some years it's more so worse, but it's it's definitely here. What a what a for your future plans i mean what it, what else can you say about or do you not want to mention any stuff on what you plan on doing or continuing in the industry for you got a lot of time to keep on hammering your <laughs> knees aren't your knees aren't bad yet are they <laughs> everything's bad <laughs> no you know i told myself this was my last year i'm just like uh in a way in a way and i think you guys can relate to this the politics of it all is what pushed me away more than anything, you know? Um, it's uh, some of, and trust me, I've got phenomenal fans. I've got, you know, everywhere yep. I go, I, people hear my voice and they turn around. Are you less John? You know, that, that humbles me. Like you can't even imagine, but there's people in the industry that are so jealous. They, you know, they hate you. They despise you. Um, I'm just going to say this real quick. Um, right when I really got to hitting on all cylinders and my show really started getting popularity and I won quite a few awards with my television show through Sportsman's Channel and then won Davy Awards and other stuff, I had a, a gentleman from Remington call me. And this is what goes on in the industry that a lot of people don't understand we had a conference call, and, of course, they've got rifles, shotgun, ammunition. And before he hung up the phone, he, he talked about ammunition. I said, sir, I'm not interested. I said, I've got Hornady, and I'm not, I'm not moving from Hornady. And he said, Les, we may own you if we want to. That's what he said. And I said, you ain't got enough money. And he laughed at me. But, see, that's the way it goes. When you're successful with one sponsor, somebody else wants to come in. There's a lot of disloyalty because somebody throws you a little more money, they expect you to jump on it. Exactly. Most, most people are strapped. I, exactly. Like trying to pay air times, editing, yep. closed captioning, film fees, all that. They're strapped, so they'll say, okay, I'll do that one. But another thing that the industry has done where the TV network – We'll call you and say, hey, Les, how's it going? Going good. Hey, is there anybody, any sponsors that you're looking at getting or you got any good contacts or are they starting to talk to you? Yeah, I've got a couple that are t starting to talk to me. Well, who are they? Because, see, they know everybody. And if you tell them, say, say I'm dealing with Hornady, they hang up, they call Hornady. And they say, tell you what, we'll give you a cheaper price We'll air a commercial during your show, but then we'll put you on 10 more TV shows, all for a cheaper price. And they've done that. And they've broke one of my good friends. And he went to YouTube, and now he is kicking it out of the park. And they're trying to get back with him, you know, to see how he made his YouTube so successful. So things like that really sour me but see people don't understand the politics of that to me it makes me sick i, I like yeah. i came from a farm background i'm very yep. loyal it's a handshake it, type of oh, deal you ain't yep. Kidding. yep last year i had a company that said we're in for ten thousand dollars after i filmed episodes with their product filmed and then i and good kills got phenomenal stuff and then wouldn't respond to my text, wouldn't respond to my emails, wouldn't respond to my phone calls after we shook hands. That isn't on me. You know what I mean? Yep. But I could probably be the bad guy. Yes. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And 
but I want people to understand it's never a yellow brick road in this industry. And that's why I've tried to remain loyal to the guys and the companies that have helped me. And I don't want 10 spots. I don't want that. I don't, you can take that. I, I've, I've went with Toyota and got all the way to the national, went through regional, got to national. As soon as they, I, I went through so much work to try to get Toyota. And as soon as they found out I killed coyotes, boom, they dropped it. They yep, wouldn't yep, even talk. Yep. To yep. Yeah. And I mean, I went to work putting together documents, seven pages of this and showing them awards and showing them viewer ratings, everything. And they loved it on the local level, went to regional, but as soon as it went to national, boom, they kicked it out. And all for what? You know what I mean? Just yeah. so I could drive a dang Toyota, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a sucky deal. A lot of people don't realize that how, how political it really is. Oh. Cutthroat. Oh, it's, it, it, it makes me sick, really. You know what I mean? It just, it's, it's, it's horrible, you know? That's why I, I'm happy with, you know, just my little bit doing my thing. I don't even need camo. I'll wear a, 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 a white bedspread or whatever. Yeah. And see, that's the thing with camo that a lot of people don't know. You don't need that high dollar this or that or that. Whatever works, keep using it. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. exactly. The we see something similar, even though we're not on that level that you're talking about regarding the, the political side of things. Where, I mean, you just it's it's a tough deal because, I mean, we're we're not doing it where we're we're getting paid by people right now to to run stuff. We're just kind of using it in videos, but man, that's a that's one of those things where you just. If you're good, like you said, what you do, the hatred that comes with it, and, and I would say the hatred stems from, like you said, jealousy. Mm -hmm. And then instantaneously, it just, you know, it just starts, it's a sucky deal. The the, the A lot of the way, I, what I'm seeing kind of right now is the forums that used to be really good. And I have, I, I'm sure you've probably heard of a forum called Predator Masters. Yeah. I was a moderator on there and I could tell you stories where I got ousted as a moderator because of the people that I worked with. And there was other sponsors that were similar to who I worked with that wanted me to work with them. And so they said, Hey, they complained to the mod the head admin and they'd say, you're done. You, you're no longer a moderate money talks. Oh yeah. And I see the guys that used to be on that forum that actually knew how to kill coyotes being gone. Yeah. And they shouldn't be. Yeah. If they want forums like that to stay alive, yeah. they need to have guys that have been in the industry for years be able to go on there and tell those kids that have are, are, are a year member wanting to know what buttons to push, dude, shut your mouth, get a hand call, and listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. And as soon as you do that, guess what? You're gone. You're banned. Whatever. I know Cal Taylor used to be on oh, there. Yeah. Tons of guys used to be on. And I'm going to try to get them on i've done a lot of trying to kind of balance a scale with those guys and i'm trying to get uh whether the president or this or that and it's it's a man it's you listen to two sides of this and that and it's just a oh the poli politics it's it's insane it is a lot of people don't understand you tell you break it down you kind of tell them and they don't believe you i uh if you Google, I, I think just Les Johnson Predator Quest, the number one thing that comes up is a thread on Predator Master. No kidding. And I think, if I remember right, it says, you think Les Johnson is all that? He's not. I think that's the heading. And it got so many views. Like, it's number one. No kidding. Yes, yes I'm hated. And, and another place where I got bombarded, I... You know, one person put on there, hey, what are you shooting for shotgun loads? And that was when lead was getting hard to find and this and that. And I just posted, hey, I've killed hundreds of coyotes using out of my 10 gauge T shot steel. T shot is the bomb. If you're going to shoot coyotes 30, 35 yards at max, you got to know your distance. I mean, they freaking come out of the woodwork to chew on me on that. No kidding. I mean, oh, I got hammered, hammered. And that's the last time I've ever been there. I'm just like, yeah. Oh well, I'll go kill coyotes. You guys can fight over stuff. That's a bummer. Yeah. And and now with social media, people are gravitating towards Facebook and like even Instagram live, being able to go Facebook live, yeah. being able to post your stuff, live stream it. It's 
I don't like saying it because those forums were where a lot of people grew up and learned yeah. so much information. A lot of knowledge. And, and, it, and it could be that way. Yeah. If those people that were the politicians understood it yeah. and worked with guys that knew what the hell they were doing, but yeah. they don't. And now, why, why, why would you stick around there? Yeah. Which I don't know. This I don't know what what happened. I don't know. I don't, why would Cal stick around there if he can't tell somebody, "Hey, dude, listen to me," yeah. without the other guy getting offended? When he could just go start a Facebook page. Yeah. Hey guys, come over here and I'll tell you how yeah. to do it. Yeah. It's slowly slowing them down so much that it's kind of it's. I don't want to say it, it might be dying. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. I think it's dwindling down. You know. I told them I'd do a podcast just to, you know, if anything, just kind of maybe get the publicity out there and help. Because there, new people want to just, there, there's a plethora of information regarding everything on there. Yeah. But I don't know. Hey, Les, uh, this is Predator Masters. We're nonprofit, but we'll give you $500. We'll scrounge it together. And can we be your closed caption and sponsor? Sure. Do you think anybody's ever asked me? Exactly. And I want to better the industry. Exactly. But, but, but then if they sponsor me, you'll have somebody say, well, you're on Les's show. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's sick. It it's is. sad. I mean, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I'm all about promoting everything. And helping, so. in the help, yes. like you said, helping people in the industry. Yep. It's just a bummer deal to see how cutthroat it is. You know, but I get 70, 80,000 views a week. A lot of times more than that. That's can't. Well, it's way more than that with Canada in. There's people never heard of Predator Master. If you put that on my show, what do you think is going to happen? Exactly. You know, a hundred percent. Hey, I can go learn about calling coyotes. You know, I'll, I'd gladly help you guys yeah. out, but it's just it's it's just a sucky situation. Yeah. It's it's so nitpicky that people are so butt hurt that somebody's better than somebody else, yeah. and they can't admit it. Yeah, you know, they just. It, I don't give two shits if somebody's better than us. We're just going to keep doing what we do. Oh, absolutely. And worry about ourselves. Go hammer down, man. Yeah. I'm, kill more than us. Get better footage than us. I'm just going to try to better myself yep. in what we do and be happy with it. But uh, YouTube, have you? we kind of chatted a little bit. Your buddy, that does, can you mention that guy? Yeah, it's Robert Arrington, Deer Meat for Dinner. I mean, oh my gosh, I think he's over 2 million subscribers now. And what does he do? everything like he free dives he can go 60 80 foot underwater he spear fishes he's he's killed giant marlin spear fishing oh wow you talk about a jack of all trades like he's he's a captain like he can he's uh run multi-millionaires boats for him and they go down to uh, costa rica and all they do is catch marlin and he's the captain of the boat, and he goes. He he uses his knowledge to go catch the so fish. So he's got a massive skill set. Uh, then, and he, then he edits all his stuff. Oh, like, he does. Oh, yeah. He does all of his own yeah. stuff. You ought to, You need to go to his channel. I'm not kidding. And and then his forte is he's a master chef. So he fixes oh, everything. He, he, you, you watch some of his fishing videos. He shows how to fillet them, and he's got a knife sponsor, which is awesome. And then he fixes the fish, and I mean, your mouth is watering when you watch him fish, yep. fix everything. What do I, What do you think? We that's kind of one of those things that it's tough. Like you said, you get somebody that was going to sponsor you, or you think you would be interested in it, and then they see you sh kill a coyote, yeah, and they're done. Yeah, they won't they won't look any further. Which we've purposely not worked with people because of that yeah. reason. Yeah, and you should. I mean, it, once you find that out, but compared to the fishing side of things, I mean, once we do what we eat, well, he's eating them. Yeah. He's catching them and eating them or whatever. But we see a lot of guys on YouTube that are doing fishing deal and doing really well. What's your, are you thinking about doing, you have a, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. You got, I, I, what, what's your subscriber at? Do you know what it I is? I don't even know. I haven't been there for so long because I'm just not into it. So like, you don't, don't, you're, you don't no, have any interest in no, doing that at all. No, I don't, you know, and it, it's just, I don't know when you get burnt out, you just get burnt out. You just you don't even, I mean? you don't even care. Yeah, yeah. And it's not that I don't care about my fans because my way of touching their life is Facebook live. Yes. Because I can be hands on right then and there. And then I don't have to worry about downloading it to YouTube, trying to figure all that crap out. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. But, 
But Robert Arrington, my buddy that did that, he was the guy that came out with Catch, Clean, Cook. Now everybody's copying that. Yeah. Everybody. I see, he was yeah. the guy that did that. I got you. He's, and he'll tell you, his fishing video, like if he shows hunting, he can about only show wild boar. That's about it because they do so much damage. He's got to show the damage that they're causing so you can justify the kill of it. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, really? That's yeah. that's what people want to see, you know. That, so, like, if he was going to do a deer, if he showed a deer that were doing massive amount of damage in somebody's cornfield or hayfield or stackyard or oh, something, yeah, yeah. you could go in and say, oh, hey. yeah. And, and he's come to South Dakota. He goes to Nebraska every year deer hunting. He loves whitetail hunting and mule deer. He's huge on it. But... But he's got to incorporate that in, and then he eats it. So he shows how to cook it. And I got you. Different meals. That's yeah. pretty interesting. But his fishing videos get so many more views than everything else. The fishing deals, Chris. He's huge on alligator. Like he's a uh, he's a master at catching those dang alligator, big ones, thirteen footers. Wow. Yeah, he's he's a killer. That's pretty. I'll I'll have to look at that. I remember. Yeah. I think you said something about that, and I looked at it. I'll have to look into a little bit more, de- more detail. That's that's interesting take on your side of things, how you're just really not interested in doing a YouTube thing. I mean, and and staying in touch with your with your the people that you you know the people that you enjoy. Yeah, Facebook, staying in touch. You know, it, it's it just got to a point, you know, where I want to live my life a little bit. Yep. You know, and I just not you know, have to worry about pleasing your sponsors. Yes. Yes. Cause even, even if you go over and above, you're never even getting given a thank you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, one example, and, and this isn't a sponsorship example, but I, I had an 08, uh, Chevy Duramax four door that I wrapped and I put all my sponsors on it, but that thing had a game warden chased me down and he drove about 10 miles right behind me, 70 mile an hour. He was like, when I say right on my tail, he was right on my tail. I had my crew set at 70 and he was right. Behind. If I would have spit, I would hit him high yep. on the windshield. He stayed behind me for five miles like that. And then we hit a County line jog and I, I slowed down just a little bit and then he, he came right up, and I mean, I'm talking two feet from the back of my pickup. He, he came up because, see, I told everybody who I was, and then he got behind me to check my licenses to make sure. But, see, I'm, I'm the Boone and Crockett. They, they don't yeah, give a yeah. crap if I'm trying to help yeah. young kids get yep. involved in yep. hunting, doing the best I can yep. to, to follow every law, do yep. everything right. They want to bust you yes. any way they can. So all your I's got to be dotted, your T's got to be crossed. When we go to a state, usually when with my brother, I always buy him a license too because I'm sure they'd get me get him for harassing wildlife. They get him for something, something just because yeah. he's on the hunt with me. Exactly. I mean that's that's the mindset I have now. I, I, I just don't even want to travel to kill coyotes. And, you know, if I go to Wyoming, I can't hunt BLM. I can't show footage on yep. it, you yep. know. So that limits you to private property. Well, I mean, a lot of them places, they're taken care of. They don't need anybody. And I just don't want the hassle, you know. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I mean, you, you ought to see. I stopped at the BLM in Rollins, Wyoming. I said, hey, I want to. I, I have a television show. I want to film some episodes, and I want to do it out in the Red Desert. What do I need to do? She handed me a stack of papers, probably two inches tall. I had to go through there. I would have to go through and GPS every spot that I was going to call, not call yet, go to those spots, GPS them, put the coordinates. They send out a person prior to my hunt, check all those areas, and then after I'm done hunting, they go back and check all those spots to make sure I don't didn't disturb the ground, looking for arrowheads, whatever, you know. I mean it's I can see I can see the game worn from a legality standpoint. I mean, everybody's within the law, but but like you said, it's almost like they're they're harassing you yeah. because yeah. you've got, as soon as you do what you do, you've got a target painted on your yeah. back. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that's the situation. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we, 
with the elk and stuff that we get in here, I've taken pictures, video, hunters, all right? We go out of our way to help hunters yep, yep. get an elk on our ground. And most of these guys are, they're literally incapable of being yeah. able to load them themselves. Yep. We'll get them loaded. We'll bring them back. Legally, they've got to be tagged. As soon as you transport yep. them, even, yep. even from the cornfield to here yeah. to a farmstead, they're supposed to be tagged. We've taken video or picture and not got that tag on. I mean, the tags on it, picture doesn't show the tag. People that follow us wow. on Instagram, yeah. and I will literally have the game warden within a day or hours call me and say, hey, James, that last elk that you got, was it tag? And we work hand in hand with the state. I've had guys turn us in for hunting at night because... I mean, a lot of the reason that we went to the Capitol and got some legislation yeah. was because guys were saying, those guys are out hunting at night and they're not using 22s or, uh, or, or yeah, 17s yeah. or, or shotguns. Jeez. And I'm, it's, it's so, I, it's a suck yes situation. It is. It's a bummer deal. And then the same thing, like you're talking about sponsors. I mean, you, 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 even with the little thing that we're doing, we get guys that are in the industry going, Hey man, what are you using? How are you using this? You know, I kind of, I, I might want to use it to break up the monotony, which I don't care, mm -hmm. go for it and use it. But then the next thing you find out is they're a sponsor with the company that you've built a relationship with <laughs> yeah. and they have a TV show <laughs> and we're like, yeah. looks like we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're like, you're trying your hardest to build a good sound relationship. Yeah. Hey man, we'll bust our ass for you. We'll do yeah. some good work for you. And then as soon as somebody else kind of snakes in, you 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 get ousted in a way. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a and we're not even close to doing some of the stuff that you've done. No, it's, but it's, I can somewhat see kind of somewhat understand what you're saying. That that's good for guys to know that. Well, the thing is, it takes the fun out of it. Exactly. You know, I want to go kill coyotes, and I want to be good at what I do, and I want to show you guys that are watching how we're doing it, how we're setting up, and how we're able to kill coyotes. But even when you try to do those things, then you try to get derailed by other stuff, whether it's a financial obligation or a, a sponsor dropping you or whatever. I mean, it just, it's, 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 it's no fun. And the thing is when you get to a point too, where you don't need them, then it's when you don't need them, then they want you. You yeah. know what I mean? Yep. And, and I'm to that point in my life where fine, go, you know, do your thing. I'll kill just as many with, what I got or how I've always done it, you know? <clears throat> yeah. It, it's nice if they would be mutually understanding when the time that you need, or it would help immensely with some assistance yeah. with you paying for X amount of dollars for a time slot on TV to, to, to show people how you do it and what you do Yeah, for them to understand that instead of playing politics and go, Hey man, you're doing a good job. A lot of people like what you're doing. They see how you're doing it. They're learning from it, but it doesn't work that way. No bummer no. deal. And the thing is, you know, nobody's going to tell you how much you contributed to the sales. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. They'll, they will, they will definitely not pad the numbers in your favor. No, no, because they don't want to ever give you credit for that. Yep. You know, and, and yep. this is, we talked about this before, but Years ago, this is probably three, four years ago, I love going up to Hornady and taking a tour of their plant. And because a lot of the people that are working in the back, I've went back there in the back before and people are actually wearing a Predator Quest hoodie as they're working, which is cool as crap. You yep. know what I mean? And a lot of people recognize me because they watch all the hunting shows and they come up and talk to me. Well, they were building on a big addition so they could – uh, they could uh, make their own brass. So they had a whole big building that they were building just for brass because Hornady is just went to the moon, you know, as far as going from when I started about number 10 or number 11 ammo manufacturer to now they're number one in, in the world, I believe. And we went to this building and Neil Davies, he's a good friend of mine as well, but he's the marketing director and I've always dealt with Neil since clear back in the day. And we walk in this building and he says, gentlemen, this building's being built because of a lot of what you do. You've brought us so many customers. Like that was cool. Yeah. 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 That was a big moment for me. And notice I didn't forget it. Like it, it made an impression on me that he appreciate because 
Um, I was the one who told them they needed a shotgun load. Oh, Les, we just, there's just no margin in shotgun. I said, build it and they yeah. will come. I promise you. And now I just put in an order for 50 cases, got them sold. I just ordered another 200 cases. And I mean, it, 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 a lot of it now is the aerial gunners. Yeah, sure. Yeah. A lot of them want to shoot four buck, but I gave some to my friends in Wyoming. I said, just try these on a coyote. Cause see, they, they, they want a more devastating blow when they're going over it. And I said, guys, I'm telling you. All those BBs going down, all you got to do is penetrate the lungs on one, and you got them. And I said, the pattern is so dense. You hit them, it just piss pounds them when you're above them. And lo and behold, now that they love it. They love it. The, the pilot told uh, Dale, Dale, was a, uh, he, he's a trapper and he's a gunner when they need one. And I asked him, I said, how are you doing? Well, I run one four first shots of four buck because we're coming up on a coyote. And then my next ones are all the BB, nickel plated BB, Hornady loads. And he said, you know, Casey, when he's flying, he says, man, I don't know what you shot the second shot, but that thing killed him dead, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he's closer and yep. it, the pattern just demolished it. You know? No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's real interesting too. So that, that's a lot of, lot of awesome information there. I mean, I good, awesome, awesome podcast. Lo, tons of information for guys to too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might be it. Might be. I guarantee you, they'll listen to it more than once. Yeah. The guys that kind of follow us and what we do, that's for sure. Uh, is what? I mean, is there anything else that you can think of that we're not really that we haven't touched base on that you would like to go over? Any like what, what we kind of mentioned? Some future plans? Anything like that? Or well, the, the big thing is I'm on a big kick for personal motivation, and I like to motivate my viewers. It, it, number one, respect the wildlife that you're hunting. Um, I have more respect for a coyote than I have for any other animal. And, and what that means is when you respect the animal, you're going to learn so much more about that animal it, it, it hurts me when I hear people talk like a coyote's a stupid animal. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I hit that thing and it was screaming and this yep. show respect for the animal, yep. you know, and you're going to become such a better hunter. But the other aspect is that no matter if you're watching Les Johnson or James O'Neill on YouTube or television we've done this for so long that it is our livelihood. It is our natural reaction. You don't have to say, well, I'm not as good as they are and, and give up. Y you want to push yourself so much harder to be better than us. And, but don't gloat and brag over it. Go out and put, put a number out there that where you want to kill four coyotes this year calling, or you want to kill six coyotes calling, or you want to kill eight coyotes calling. That's what I did clear back in the day. My friend, Norm Heater out in Wyoming said, uh, I said, what's your best day? He said, eight coyotes. And it, first thing he said was, Johnson, you'll never do that. That's what he told me. And I said, Psh, I'll have that dead by noon someday. And by God, I did. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, but you got to put it in your mindset. And you don't ever need to brag about it. You know, yeah, if you're happy about it, you know, hang it on the wall, get some good pictures. I think that's wonderful, but put, try to get out there and get in shape, shoot your gun, get good at it and understand that I've done all this with a hand call and you don't have to have an e-call. You don't have to have pup distress. That isn't going to be your salvation. Uh, my brother last, uh, last winter, he calls me and he's, he lives down in Cocker city, Kansas. And he has a, a place called Lakeside lodge. And he's a hell of a fisherman. Like if there's a fish biting, he can find it. And he takes people and they always have the time of their life. He goes out calling and my brother calls a lot different than me, but he loves using hand calls. So he went out last winter, not this winter, but back in 2019, 2020. And my brother loves Budweiser. 
it, it, no nothing against him. He just at five o'clock he's cracking a Budweiser, you know. And he lives right across from the bar, and the bar is his buddy owns it. So he goes calling. He goes out to Norton, Kansas, which is 50, 60, 70 miles from his place on a winter day, and he hunts nothing but walk-in, and he just spent part of the day out there. He killed three coyotes. He killed two bobcats. Both of them were big toms, and he hit another great big tom. He said, Les, that thing was 40 pounds, 30 yards. He'd come out of a plum thicket and was just sitting there looking at him, and he didn't want to move to get his rifle, so he said, I'm going to kill you. He had a Benelli, and he pulled up, and he shot, and the thing just just started flipping around, jumping. He shot again. It went in the plum thicket, so he thought, well, I'll find it. He said the stuff was so thick he couldn't find that cat. made him sick. So he gets home, he has three coyotes and two bobcats, and this is like in January when it was tough calling. He goes to the bar, he's sitting at the bar and joking around, and he's wearing Predator Quest. He loves wearing Predator Quest hoodie, and this guy come up to him, he said he was a redheaded guy, he's never seen him before, and he started trying to pick a fight with him, saying, you think you can call coyotes? <laughs> and And Jeff you got to know Jeff. He just said, yeah, I can call coyotes, you know, and he was just being fun. And, and that guy goes, oh, I bet you're not that good. And he goes, yeah, I'm that good. And uh, he goes, did you get any today? And he said, yeah, they're out in the back of the pickup. And he stormed out there and went and looked. And he was trying to tell him he didn't kill him, you know, that day. <laughs> and, but, but the thing, the moral of this story is, my brother calls so much different than me, and he's so successful. He never gets no camera time. He doesn't have a Facebook. He doesn't have Instagram. He don't even know how to own or operate his phone, but he's a killer, and you've got to have that mindset. He loves calling thick brush. He loves that, and he don't call loud. He calls hand call. You know, he just... We can all call different, and we can all be good. And I don't want any viewers watching right now thinking they have to be like me. They have to call like Les Johnson. They have to call like James O'Neill. They have to call like Keith. It, it don't have to be that way. But you have to put it in your heart and your mind that you've got to give it 110%. You're not going to do it lackadaisy. Oh, I'm going to park right here, and I'm going to walk 10 yards and make a stand. You've got to put up. Put on your big boy pants and do some walking, and you've got to get yourself in shape and push yourself harder than you've ever pushed yourself. That's coming from that's a hundred. Uh, the those last five minutes of what you said is basically everything that you need to know, and that's right a hundred percent in line with exactly what our mindset is. It's it's uh, I mean, you have to try hard. You have to, I mean, it's, it's a skill set that you, every, anybody can do it. And I really like how you brought in the respect side of thing. We exactly, we yeah. get so much hatred online, not, not from, well, we get enough of it from, from like-minded hunters because yeah. of what we use or how yeah. we use it or whatever. You just let it in one ear out the other, but the antis in this day and age don't understand how much respect we actually have yeah. for what we're pulling the trigger on. Yeah. We go to a lot of work just to be able to, and I don't, I, I really hate to bring in the, the ethical, I, I say it, but it is, it's, it's ethical how we can take a precision instrument and place a shot precisely on an animal, whether it's you making a running shot that you've done thousands of times or us working them into a spot yep. and getting them to stop to shoot them lights out in the head or whatever. I mean, we're doing, we're taking a lot of extra steps to be more respectful of that animal. And I'm like you, I don't want to see them all dead. I know guys that have such pure hatred for coyotes that they would like to extinct them. Yeah. I don't like, I'm not a hundred percent. not like that. If we have a problem, guess what? We'll go help ourselves and eliminate the problem. Yeah. But I, I exactly what you said, man, that's, that's a perfect way to kind of, I think polish stuff up here. Yeah. That's that's awesome to be able to have uh, someone like you here, and that's that's been there, that's done it, that's got skin in the game, that's freaking walked the walk from the beginning to now. And I, I'm one of the guys. I'd like to see more of what you do. I mean, it'd be cool to see more 
like I said, the, the TV show side of things, from our perspective, I enjoy watching it. There's not, there's so many guys on TV that we won't, we get five minutes and done. I yeah. won't even watch it again. Yeah. But, you know, it's, 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 it, it's cool hearing your perspective, kind of where you came from, all of the details. Uh, I'd like to stay in touch, and I think it'd be cooler in hell to do some kind of a collaboration this fall some, or yeah. this winter or something sometime. If You're always welcome up here if you ever want to do something. I'd Absolutely. like to. I'll run the camera. I don't care. I'm all about being behind the camera, just capturing footage. I learn more things from behind the camera than I do, you know, yeah. sitting down in front of the gun, and I'd like to, you know, if you if you're if you would or you're interested, that'd be pretty cool to do sometime. Believe it or not, you know, running the camera is artwork itself. It, it, it's it's a special thing. Even like my brother says the thing, same thing. He said, "I'd rather keep running the camera because I get like, why don't you call a stand or two? That's no, I don't. I don't. Yep, I don't yep. It's more fun. Yep. You know, yep. capturing the hunt." It, it takes a lot of talent, yeah. you know. Like James always says, the easy part's pulling the trigger. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could see f- for the way we kind of do it, it is. But running and shit, you got to have a. There's a skill set there where you. That's <laughs> and my, my my my. I'll have to put a plug in, Dad. He's like, you guys need to do some running shit. You guys got to put a bunch of collabor or a bunch of <laughs> videos of running. That standing stuff is too damn easy. And I'm like, gosh, damn. Well, we're gonna get a guy hopefully on that knows how to do that. <laughs> well. Since you brought that up, I get asked a lot, how do you lead a coyote? I mean, that's important. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 But like you and I have talked about on the, the caliber early on, what caliber? 22, 250. I'm shooting 35 uh, or 3650 to 3780 or 3680 roughly feet per second. So if I have a coyote at 150 yards kind of loping, quartering away from me he came in he saw something he didn't like he turned around he started loping if i don't think that coyote's going to stop i'm going to put it about one to two feet right in front of him boom, pull the trigger and it just goes in right in his rib cage now a lot of people probably would put it right on him shoot right behind him and yep, then yeah. he's he's yeah, gone, gone but you yep. got to lead him now full out broadside uh typically what i do is i just lead through him and get right in front of him pull the trigger so i start behind him pull through them and then pull the trigger as I'm still moving. Um, but then again, it don't matter your speed usually then, because whenever you're moving your barrel, the same speed, you're putting that barrel at the same speed as that coyote, you know, yep. Yep. whenever it leaves the barrel, it's like a follow through, if you will. So uh, the running thing, it, it, it never came easy, but I've shot at so many running coyotes. See from Nebraska where I was born and raised, I used to drive around in the morning, so I uh, we'd drive around. We're farm country, so every coyote you saw was on a dead run. Yep. They they were never standing. You never got a standing shot. So I would drive. Um, I'd drive towards the east, towards the sun coming up. First thing in the morning, I'd leave my dad's farm, and then I would go over a mile or two. And then as the sun was starting to come up, I'd drive with the sun so I could see the coyotes easier. Uh, probably the best morning I ever had was three coyotes, but I kill, I killed everything I seen usually, but you would have to time him to coming around where he's going to cross a road. You had to learn what that coyote was going to yep. do, how he was yep. going to do it. And every time you got a crack at one, it was always a running shot. A lot of times going over corn rows or whatever. And obviously, um, I, I just, I missed enough where I started to figure it all out and I shooting one gun, one velocity, one bullet the, my whole life. That's what's done it. Yep. So we can relate yep. really close to that. And like you said, that 22, 250 that we, we've ran the six creed, the, the, the 22 creed. If you want to extend your ranges and, and get that higher BC, that's a whole different deal. But the twenty two two fifty has been such a solid performer for us. Inherently accurate. I mean, it it, it it shoots straighter in hell. It's got that speed there. It's from the beginning of it to now. It's just been a, a solid cartridge selection for 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 what we do, killing coyotes. Yeah, it's so, hands down. I think one of the best. Yeah, me too. I would one hundred percent agree. It's it's primarily all we use. Exactly. Well, dude, I mean, gosh, dang, that's awesome. Tons of information there. It, it is, I think I, we could do probably another podcast sometime. It would be cool to, it would have been cool to be able to get something figured out for Facebook Live. 
we would have got a lot more followers from you than you will of us, but it would have been regardless. I'll try to figure something out here on, on how I get this up. And, uh, any, is there anything else? I, we went over anything else that you can think not, of not or that I, not that I got you, you're solid too. Nothing else that you want to touch base on. I don't think so. Cool deal. Uh, I, it'd be cool to, we'll chat after this and maybe, uh, work something out next year it'd be awesome Absolutely. to do a little collaboration i'll film you yep. guys can shoot or we'll make john film <laughs> john's our kind of our <laughs> gopher he's not here he's messing around doing something but that's james little brother yeah yeah is your brother older than you or younger yeah. is he a little bit older two years older oh yeah. so you guys are close yeah he's we're got really good eyes i mean he can spot those he's got yeah like 2010 i mean his eyes are there's times he can see the coyotes. I can't see them in binos. Do you wear glasses or contacts or anything? Contacts. So do I. Yeah. So do I. You got good eyes. Yeah, I, I got to wear contacts. But, yeah. Cool, dude. Well, I'm going to phase us out. And, uh, you know, I, I had an awesome time. I hope you guys found this podcast very informational. Uh, tons of content there that everybody can learn from. Uh once again, guys, we had Les Johnson with Predator Quest on Instagram Live. I'm going to figure out how to save that. We had Keith Rissy as co-host. And once again, I'm James O'Neill as your host. Be sure to uh, check out our Ooh. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channel. And uh, we've got to be sure to subscribe. We've got a ton of content out there, ton of information. And we are out. <laughs>